Welcome back to another episode of the Young Guides Podcast. I'm Keaton, and this is... I'm Kyle. But first, a word from our partners. First up, we want to talk about Heather's Choice. If you go to the Heather's Choice website and use our code, theyoungguides15 at checkout, you can get yourself 15% off site-wide. So go check them out. We got packaroons for snacks. We got dinners. We got breakfasts. We got a bunch of new recipes coming out to you guys. So head on over to heatherschoice.com at checkout. Use our code, the young guides 15 and get you guys something for your next outdoor adventure. Awesome. For our next partner, we have lucky bug lures home of the bingo bug, zombie max fusion extreme lucky plug F bomb and pike bomb. They take conventional lures and change them up a little bit and it helps your fishing and your luck on the water go check them out www.luckybuglures.com go get yours today all right up next we have northern knits emily up here in anchorage knits wool hats and uh, distributes them through her social media platforms you can find her on facebook or on instagram her instagram account is northern dot underscore dot knits and uh, you can see some of the hats that she has in stock and order from there or you can kind of get an idea of what you want message her and you can set something up uh, to have a specific uh, pattern or color scheme that you want in your hat keaton and i both have one well uh, i actually have several <clears throat> keep you very warm they're very fashionable they look great they feel great You'll look awesome if you wear one too. Check her out, Northern Knits. Next up, we have a friend, Matt, at Alaska Rod Co. He just released a new lineup of rods for the 2022 season. They have a lineup of eight freshwater spinning rods with actions and power for anglers chasing big, aggressive fish. With lengths ranging from six foot to nine foot, there are plenty of options for various applications and style. In a world full of mass-produced rods, Alaska Rod Co. makes sure that rods and services provide what other brands cannot. Rods built and tested in Alaska. Matt also is coming out with a new line of fly rods. Alaska Rodco fly rods are built for harsh environments while maintaining the utmost level of craftsmanship. Right now, Alaska Rodco has nine foot fly rods ranging from five weights to eight weights. Ten foot single hand rods, switch and spay rods will be available late winter or spring. There's enough rod comings out there trying to build the next lightest and flashy rod. Alaska Rodco is here to build you a rod you can pass down generations. Fishing means many things to many different people. Alaska Rod Co. is honored to build you the ultimate tool that connects you to that meaning. If you want to learn a little bit more about Alaska Rod Company, go back and check our previous podcast. We asked him several questions about his rods, his warranties. Um, it does, he does a great job at explaining everything and covering everything about his company also if you have questions you can always dm him or dm us and we can get you going in the right direction so alaska rod co finally we want to say thank you for listening to another episode of the young guides podcast if you can head on over to apple Podcasts, leave us a review and a rating it helps us know that we're uh, doing this for the right reasons and you guys are giving us some great feedback already you can also head over to spotify they now have a rating feature on the podcast there so if you could let us know how we're doing that would be great it also helps you or excuse me helps us spread the word through you um but makes us pop up on the feeds um wherever you listen to podcasts a lot more if you give us a great rating and a great review you can also head to our website and contact us through that form. If there's anything that you think we should know about, if you want to be on our show or if there is something that uh, we need to work on, you can also find us on Instagram and same thing. Give us some feedback, drop us a message, and we will get back to you. With Instagram, make sure to also check our story. We uh, Before we do our podcast on Thursdays, we always have an option for you guys to ask questions to the people coming on our podcast. Um, and we, get, we post a lot of stuff that we like to get uh, viewers and people following us involved. So if you want to head on over, give us a follow and uh, 
start asking questions and join in on the fun on our Instagram page. Without further ado, here's the episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Young Guides Podcast. I'm Keaton, and this is... I'm Kyle, and on today's episode, we have on Stephen Isaac. Stephen is from the Northwest, uh, Pacific Northwest, um, but has spent a lot of time uh, up in Alaska guiding, and um, figured we'd bring him on the podcast, talk to him a little bit about his uh, guiding experience in Alaska, Um, And then a lot of the outdoors things that he does um, in the lower 48, um, hunting, fishing, um, running around the Pacific Northwest. So with that, welcome to the podcast, Stephen. Thank you, guys. Uh, Thanks for having me. Um, Hope you guys are all well. Um, (laughs) Kyle, you said you were from Alaska. Hope you're staying warm up there. Keaton, and I hope you guys are all getting out fishing soon. So, Oh, for sure, man. We appreciate it. It's, uh, yeah, things are starting to warm up up here and fisher fish are to be had where you can find them it's just a bit of a drive right now absolutely well let's kind of let's get rolling into it let's, can you tell us a little bit about your background like um just kind of where you're from um and how you got into fishing um i i grew up just outside of seattle in uh, a town called north bend um just uh on the east side of the Seattle area um, of I-90. Um, made it about halfway through high school. Uh, my, my, my dad decided to relocate back at home in Eastern Oregon. And I spent pretty much my college college days and my last two, two years of high school in Eastern Oregon at Hermeson and Pendleton High School. Um, been there and then I uh did a little bit a little bit of time up at WSU for uh for for some college as well as a college down here in Pendleton Oregon um and then uh we you know throughout that pretty much pretty much spent most of my time my adult life in in Pullman for a couple years and then the Tri-Cities and a little bit of Hermiston so um that's just pretty much my background of where I've been but um, to answer your other question, uh, I've kind of been pretty fortunate that um, got addicted to fishing at a young age from my dad, who uh, who also uh, guided for a little bit in Washington and up in Alaska as well for for about five seasons up there. Um, in his late twenties, um, maybe early thirties, a little bit, and so I've been kind of put with the born with a fishing rod in my hand you can say um nice and uh got to learn from him and then uh my, one of my other mentors who his who is his best friend that he guides out there on the olympic peninsula as well to these days and then a little bit on the Cowlitz as well um and he's been up in alaska as well in the same region as i as i've been throughout the years in the in the bristol bay region that's where he spent most of his time as well Um, and so I got to learn from him as well up there, but I I don't know when I haven't had a rod in my hand, you know, pretty much, you know, when I'm working a a real job, quote unquote, you know, it's probably the only time I haven't had a rod in my hand. Um, did, did, uh, did hunting kind of follow with that too? Like, did you just grow up doing the whole outdoor thing or did it come later for you? How did, how did that play out too? Um, I, I think hunting came in probably i want to say my freshman year of high school maybe maybe eighth grade um i remember taking might have been my sophomore year but i remember taking 100 ed class and really didn't didn't do much for a little bit i got to run down here to eastern oregon with my dad one time got to skip some school and watch him shoot a deer for the first time nice. which was a little different experience for somebody who hasn't been around any of that before being yeah. you know being from the, the west side of Washington and not getting out. I mean, I knew all about wildlife and all that stuff, but never, never really partaked in any of that stuff. And then I think, I don't know if it was my junior year or my sophomore year, but I got to go down and I got to shoot my first buck down here in Eastern Oregon. And, and so after that, I've kind of been, you know, right here um, from my junior year on. So this kind of been part of the lifestyle down here and, and, you know, 
I think it tastes better than beef too. So you keep going yeah. at it and filling up those freezers and, and, uh, pretty much mostly on the hunting side, it's pretty much mostly been, been, uh, like big game mule deer. Um, and then towards the end of my senior year, kind of got into a little bit more pheasant hunting. Uh, I could, I'd say my junior year, I did a lot of quite a bit of hunting before my grandfather passed away. Um, down there in Pendleton. Um, we did a lot of pheasant hunting out there and I take, I'd actually take around a little bit through middle school, walking the fields, playing bird dog a little bit, you know, picking up pheasants. So I had a little bit, I can say. Um, but most of it before getting towards my senior year of high school was with like mule deer hunting, but, um, what a, what a great place to be to Eastern Oregon with, they got some big mule deer and I've heard they've got some pretty big elk in certain areas and stuff like that. So, not a bad place to start out. No, I mean, it's been, it, it's pretty fortunate, especially um, in the base of the blue region uh, where, where we, where we hunt, we, we hunt out uh, west of Pilot Rock, like a little bit of southwest of Pilot Rock, I think is, is, is the direction. Um, and I've had a family friend that we, we, we've been using that land for, uh, my great, great grandfather, took like 50 bucks off of it so he was on it for 50 years prior to us so we you know we just had that family connection with them so and we'd like to keep it in the family and we've been blessed with it and you know eventually we we end up leasing it out you know just to keep keep it so we you know because it's kind of like more tradition now than anything you know it's like oh if you wanted to you can go go to a trip in montana and go try to chase that lifetime muley or whatever or you just go spend time with cousins and stuff like that for deer season and yeah and, and stuff like that and just chomp around in, in the rolling hills and the timber that we that we hunt on so that's awesome heck yeah, heck yeah. so <clears throat> tell us a little bit about how um after high school um from the information that you sent us um it sounds about that's about the time you started getting into guiding and getting moving or thinking about moving to alaska um yeah, so graduate graduating from high school, um, my dad's best friend, um, Keaton, might have heard of him, uh, but his name's Bob Kratzer, Robert Kratzer, Angler Guide Service on the Olympic Peninsula. Um, one of the one of the one of the I can't necessarily say bigger names, but uh, he known over there in Forks, been in the Forks community for a while. But he gave me a call upon graduating, and he's like, "Hey." Uh, you want to come up and work for me in Alaska at a, at a lodge called Mission Lodge um, there in Bristol Bay outside of Dillingham. I didn't know what I was doing, you know, <laughs> 18 years old. All my buddies are like, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. Let's go this. Let's go. Let's go to the Lincoln, Lincoln uh, City Beach House of the families. We'll go out there and we'll, you know, go have a good, you know, senior trip or whatever. And I'm like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, you know. And I thought about it probably no more than four hours hearing my dad's stories about going up there, you know, from 80 to 85. Um, and I was like, you know, I'm stupid if I don't just take this and do it for a year or two years, you know, why, why I get, get my foot into community college and whatever. And, and he's like, yeah, you'll just, you know, you'll just do camp hand stuff, which if people are not familiar with what a camp hand is, um, it, you're just, like grunt work but you're filling up planes where when i was at this place you were filling up boats vacuum pack fish filleting fish mowing lawns picking up clients um hauling luggage you know and one thing that was cool about this place that that you know from any other places that i've heard that they actually gave these employees like one day off during the week so every once in a while you would get to go out so you got to learn a little bit more and get to talk to some of the guides and all that stuff but Eventually, I was like, "Yes, let's do it. I'll, I'll go up there." And so, you know, being the person who I am, I I overpacked for the first year, you know, <laughs> and I loved it. I it was, you know, growing up primarily salmon fishing and steelhead fishing with 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 a gear rod, you know, you're like, dude, this is like paradise on earth, you know, like you're like can't go without a cast catching a fish, you know, and and, and getting the fly out everywhere because it was a fly out lodge and. I came back and, you know, they like, hey, do you want to come back? And I'm like, sure, I'll come back. I'll do another year, you know, so year, year two. Um, and I, I don't remember if it was 
if it was the end of the first year or end of the second year, um, what didn't really, I did, you know, growing up, did a little bit of power bait fishing for trout. I never really, you know, maybe picked up the fly rod once or twice with my dad going down the Yakima. Um, maybe, maybe kicked a, kick, kicked the float tube around in Chapaca once or twice. That was pretty much all truly my, 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 my fly fishing experience on anything, maybe throwing streamers for, for silvers up there was the other thing, but I gotta go, gotta go fly out and, uh, go fish for, you know, quote unquote, big trout. And after that, I came addicted with a fly rod and that it, it, it was actually like a birthday trip. And I don't remember if we couldn't get, get to where we were going and we started fishing like little hopping in on planes and doing like that stuff. So I was like, screw this. And I talked to Bob and I was like, Hey, going in there. I was like, Hey, you think there's any chance that I can guide, you know, like, he's like, I'm not uh, like, why not? So jumped in, went through the coast guard class, just the, uh, Western waters, Alaska one. I don't know if they still have that one. I know I'm grandfathered in on it. I know they might have just the Bristol Bay portion now, but like, it's, you know, mostly just your, um, Iliamna systems and the, and the, the knack knack and you know the tick chick wood systems a little bit i think is what that new one is i i don't know i got to talk to a couple guys about it but that's random um just went through that and you know got my coast guard license and, and the game plan that year was was to have me still do camp hand work you know this is like my third year up there do camp hand work and then like get a couple days in guiding just get used to it you know and I probably had my, my, got my Coast Guard license in from the, from the Coast Guard mailed up to me. And it was probably no more than three weeks. One of the guys up there just wasn't cutting it. And he said he was, you know, like having problems, like with pressure with clients in the, in the boat. And so they're like, okay, here's the box of flies. Go, you know, you're going to go fish the Gula Walker. You know, so I did that for three weeks and, you know, if we didn't have anybody, I'd stay back and do some campaign stuff, ask questions. So I was kind of like thrown in the wolves a little bit, you know, so, um, and then they're like, well, one thing, you know, we weren't going to do this to you because you were new, but like one of the things of being a guide, you got to go stay two weeks out, you know, out at an out camp, you know, so they just leave you out in the middle of nowhere for two weeks and then send clients in or send you out there with another guide and, and do that. So I got stuck out on a month on the Togiak fishing silvers. And, and one of the guys that mentored me, um, Jimmy Midkiff, uh, no longer with us, but awesome dude. He's, uh, he's like, okay, if you fish, if you fish gear with clients, you're, you're going out, you're going to learn, you're going to go fly fishing. If you fly fish with clients, you can go gear fish. And I'm not even worried about your gear fishing because you've done that your whole life. And, and, and so I got to learn more that way. And then, you know, also, you know, during the bead drop up there, that was a whole new, new interesting thing for a guy that's only thrown, you know, like size 14 caddises or are kicked around with chronomids on, on Chapaca. And it was like, dude, this is, this is crazy. And, you know, you're catching 20 inch trout and you're like, dude, this is cool. I could do this. I could get into this man. And, Thank you. and it was, it was one of those things where it's like, okay, I, I I'm, no longer just addicted into the fly fishing world. I'm just addicted to guiding because I enjoy being there with people. I enjoy, um, uh, I just enjoy putting smiles on people's face. You know, that, I think that's one, that's probably one of the most rewarding parts of, about the guiding process, but to continue with the career and all that stuff, my fourth year, I just, I, I um, Bob left Mission Lodge and he owned Alaska Kingfishers on the Nushigak. Um, as well as managing Mission Lodge. And he's like, okay, it's time to move on and, and just run run my business. And so he went over there. I was like, well, I'm still in, in community college, um, still just racking up all the credits. And I was like, I'll come to Mission Lodge. It's it's fun. We get a fly out. We can do anything. And they're like, okay, you're still green. We'll, uh, we'll let you guide four, like four days a week, three days a week, still do some camp and stuff. I'm like, dude, I'm still learning. As long as I can learn and, and, and do it. I get there, they're like, okay, first day I get there, don't, you know, take two crew members out, and we, I guided that day, and then I guided one other day for the whole three-month season. I was just bummed. Mm. I was bummed. They 
people didn't even believe in me or, or whatnot. I don't know what happened with that. And I was just kind of bummed. I was like, okay, maybe this is the end of my Alaska venture at this rate, you know? Yeah. And so it was kind of, I mean, that's still fun. I got to go out and fish a little bit. I still knew a lot of people at the lodge. I still made the best of it, but it was kind of just kind of sour because I thought I was guiding, you know? And so not knowing what I was doing um, and, you know, my dad and, and, and Bob, since they're best friends, they talk quite a bit and going into like November or something like that, he goes, okay, forget that. Come over and guide Kings over on the Nusha Gap with me. Never back told in my life, but he's like, well, you'll camp hand, you know, fill up boats in the morning, fillet fish with us, backing packet, do dishes, and we'll fill, get you into guiding, you know, until you're finished with college or whatever. I'm like, okay, fine. I'm up in Alaska. I trust you. One of, one of, one of my buddies now, um, he was like upgrading or doing something with Coast Guard license that first week hit. Okay, back up. This is, this is now year five of going into Alaska and this doing something completely different back trolling for Kings, you know, yeah. never done before. Guy doesn't get his coast guard license in time and they check that river pretty regularly for, you know, with, with, um, with state troopers coming out there and checking for all that stuff. And once again, here, here's a box of wiggle warts, go find fish. I know you're on find fish. You'll do fine. Throw under the wolves again and spent, I don't know, 2008 to 2015 doing, doing the Kings. And, and it was one, some of the funnest times I've had, you know, you know, short season grind, putting up camp, kind of put the love of back into King fishing for me, you know, after doing all the fly stuff and, and, and stuff like that. And I mean, Kyle, I know you probably heard of the Michigan. I don't know if you've gotten a chance to go over there. I mean, it's still probably one of the best runs in the state. And it just watching Rod go after Rod after going after Rod, you know, Keaton, you probably fish down here where you're like, oh, it could be a day. It could be three days before we get a bite, you know, like right. it's, it's just it how was it. just incredible. It was so incredible. The so, forecast between like Washington State and Alaska is just like night and day. I mean, even like with declines and stuff in Alaska, it's still like it's ridiculous. Uh, just what we could be, you know. So I'll uh, I'll, I'll give you. I, I I don't have the exact numbers, but I'll I think I heard something with Bristol Bay for this upcoming forecast, and I think they were projecting near eighty million for the whole bay. So. Ooh. this year of sockeye or like all sockeye, yeah, sockeye. yeah that's i don't crazy. know what it is kings i haven't i haven't paid attention to the kings very much in in the recent years because i i only go over there to set up camp now um we'll, 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 i'll get to that part here in a little bit but in that time frame from in 08 to 15 um I want to say 2012, uh, Rafa Wentas ended up purchasing Kingfishers, 2012 or 2013 Kingfishers from, from Bob. Um, and it was kind of one of those, like, a couple years after that big, like, 2010 crash in the, in the, in the Kingfishery. And a lot of camps got hurt and stuff like that. And, and so Rob, who owns the place where I'm at now, is Alaska Bear Call Lodge. He bought Alaska Kingfishers from, from Bob. And I was just going through and in 2013, he goes, I need an extra guide. I've had experience on the Gula Walk. He goes, I need an extra guide to go fish silvers and, and trout on the Gula Walk. So I went over there. So I got to know Rob that way. And I did that for 2013. Uh, and then 2014, I went back over there and I was going to do a little bit of trout, but one of my good friends, um, him and I, we got to go stay on the Nishigak for, for a month. And it's fish silvers, and it's a real streaky because um, you're so down low, and you're fishing just streams of silvers coming through. You know, <laughs> you'll go through having you know probably a thousand fish come in front of you, and you'll get you know ten, and then they'll die off for you know thirty minutes or so, and and the next thing you know, here comes a stream. So we did that, and we only out of the whole month, we only got a guide ten days because of weather. We either couldn't get people into us or they didn't have anybody to us. So that was an interesting year. And I had some things in my life, you know, I was, I had a girlfriend at that time and I wanted to go, you know, spend more time with her and she ended up leaving 
leaving in 2014 on me before going back up to Alaska. And I was like, okay, well, I'll go back to Alaska and reevaluate everything and, you know, try to go find a real job. So I went back in 2015 and just did the King season. And I was like, okay, I'm pretty sure I'm done. I'm going to go find a real job, try to do real things. And so through, throughout this time, um, this look more about my background. I was working at a pizza shop up in Pullman through that time for, you know, winter work, managing a pizza shop. And then uh, I got into, I'm, 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 this is kind of backtracking of who, who I am. I, I got into playing poker quite a bit and, and learning that, that. And then, so I ended up starting dealing poker. And that was pretty good money. Um, and so when I moved to the Tri-Cities, Kennewick, um, I, you know, started out at security because you just don't get in there. And so I would do that in the winter. Um, I dealt poker and, and worked my way to do poker, dealt in the pit a little bit um, to make money to get through the winter before going back up to Alaska. I've been very fortunate with that. All the, all the uh, winter work, I had, you know, folks, you know, say, hey, you know, people need more hours in the summer anyways, and you just go come back, we'll get you back on the schedule. So it's been pretty cool, you know, whether working in a college town or, or doing that. So I've continued got to do it that way. Yeah. But 2015, I said, okay, maybe it's time to pony up and do a real job. And and so I did that, and I was looking at things. And um, going into 2016, the casino I was working at closed its doors on December 4th, I think it was, December 4th, December 6th. No notice, sign up there. I was already working another job at that time, trying to transition from working full-time poker into, into an actual career. I got, I got started into heating and air, um, and started doing that throughout the, throughout the winter, a little bit of fall and started, you know, into spring. Um, I really, really got into it. Oh, well, actually, actually, excuse me, back up track. I, that spring I started mowing lawns just to do something different. Cause I knew I was, I wasn't going back up to Alaska yeah. and I got the opportunity of one from somebody who I was doing poker. He had a spot opening up as like an HVAC tech. And so sound like a little bit more of a career than mowing lawns, you know, just trying to do that. So I, I dove into that. Yeah. And in, in 2000, yeah, 2016, 2017 transitioning, I did that. So I started doing a check and we went through the whole, whole summer did that. I got a couple messages from my buddies at, at Bear Claw and, and from Rob said, Hey, would you come back? I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm trying to start my, my, my career, my own life. I, I committed to this, you know, I can't, I can't do it. And then this, the February rolls around, uh, things got slow. Um, and, and, and the guy who I, I knew he's like, Hey man, I don't want to do this, but I gotta let you go because the business slow. Yeah. A little, little, little other kind of side story that plays into, into where, I, where I'm getting at with the career, continue going to Alaska. My, my best friend growing up, who's a couple years younger than me, he passed away early February. Uh, he was like 26 or something like that at, at that, that point in time. Um, and so I went up, I went back home to North Bend. I went back to his memorial. I got, I got back after all that stuff. I'm waiting for that call because, you know, some, sometimes those units are getting, you know, getting back into working or redoing installs in, you know, late February in early March, you know, and I was waiting for a call and, 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 and the, my heating and air guy called me and that's when he called and he goes, Hey man, I'm, I'm going to have to let you go. You know, uh, it, we're not busy right now. And, and, and it's like, okay, man, I understand this sucks. It's like, well, I got to go get my tools out of the truck, you know, it's like, okay. So I go, go, uh, get my, get my, uh, get my tools, went and stopped and, and, and talked to, talked to another buddy that I was doing a little bit of side work because it was a little bit of slow. I needed to make some income for like that. And I had one of the other guys I dealt poker to, he owns Papa Murphy's. And so, you know, being a pizza experience, he's like, yeah, dude, come on in. We'll, we'll, we'll put you to work, you know? So I, I was doing that. I was like, Hey dude, I just got let go of this. If you have more hours, da, da, da. I come back, I get back to my, my uh, dining room table. And I literally sit down there, sit at the table, put my hands in my head. I'm like, dude, what am I going to do? You know, I just committed to this and now this is gone. No more than an hour after that conversation, my phone lights up. It's Rob Fuentes. 
the owner of Bear Claw Lodge. Hey, Steve-O. Hey, how you doing, man? I'm ah, doing this. You know, this has been really good. My best friend passed away. We just did this more. I hear that. You know, I'm sorry about that. Da, 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 da. You know, he's like, well, I had two guides fell on me. I need a guide. Oh, well, I just got let go an hour ago from the heating and air job. <laughs> yeah, I'll come back. And so, like, I had to go do the whole renewal of the Coast Guard. And I was like, I guess this is where I'm supposed to be. So for the last five years, I've been back at Bear Claw um, doing that. Met some cool people so, in and out of there. It's been fun. It's a, it's a, it's a littler lodge than, than Mission Lodge. Um, we do probably max 12 people, but we sit comfortably right about 10 people in there. Um, Mission Lodge was a big flyout lodge, so you were flying out to your destinations most of the time. And we just usually fish the Gula Walk fish. Um, they'll, they'll do a fly out in the, in the first half to go fish Kings, part of the Kingfisher group. And then, you know, come back, fish, do their sockeye and their trout. And I've, I've been there for the last uh, six years now, going on seven, you know, with the, with the pandemic and, and just going through the whole new renewal of my Coast Guard. Yeah. And I love it up there, man. It's peaceful. Um, Rob takes care of me. Um, and I, I'll, I, I can't speak for everybody who does it, but I don't do it for the money. I do it for the love of it. Um, Absolutely. and I, I, I just, the best, the best way I, I, I can put it is when I said it earlier is watching, putting a smile on somebody's face, you know, after catching trout or after catching silvers, when we do silvers late, um, also, one of the other things we do at this little lodge is in, when, when the small creeks, when salmon start dropping, we do beads and we'll hike in to a couple small creeks and, and, and do that. Um, and it's kind of fun to wade through a little bit and, and follow bear trails. And yeah. whether it's you're behind a bear, if you, you look in the tracks, this past, this past uh, season, I was about 20 feet, 25 feet from one that was walking down the creek that was probably – I don't know. This creek was no bigger than 15 feet wide. You know, it's like, oh, hey, bear. Uh, I had two old duffers, and I, you know, I threw mud at him, and it went up and around. And I sat there for a little bit, looking to try to see where he would go. And and I was like, yeah. The guy's like, well, you good? Do you think we're good? I go. I look at these two guys behind me, and I'm like, I, I think I'm good, but I don't know about you guys. You know. And so that was one of the little fun things and little 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 scary moment i've had you know i've had another one that came within like 30 feet of me from where the boat sockeye fishing little, little two-year-old i mean i know kyle's probably experienced some of this stuff too they come out of nowhere but you know it gets you get your heart pumping a little bit you know like oh crap i don't have to worry about me i gotta worry about clients and you know mm -hmm. we don't really have we haven't had too many problem bears up there you know so it's been that's been good so that's a little bit of my background with it with the guiding part of it um it's, i know it's kind of a little bit long but it, it's kind of i don't know i think it's kind of a cool story about going through the ups and downs and and the temperature and how long you know um no for sure i think that's a great great story because i mean it, that's just that's the exact thing that a lot of guides face right is when you have your off season you got to figure out ways to support yourself and when your season especially in alaska you know it's may well depending on river closures and stuff like that and runs it's for me personally it's like may end of may early june through like the middle end of september so it's really not that long and you've got all that time frame in between you got to figure out something else to do and even back home in washington yeah we could guide basically march through december but in that time frame between, you still have to find something. So when you're in the outdoor industry, making um, making a job off of Mother Nature, right, and and trying to survive off of that, you got to figure something else out. So I think your story is an, an excellent example of you having experienced that and what other people in the industry experience. I mean, I I, I personally have had a couple opportunities to to work at a couple places down here, but. You know, I, I pretty much like with my whole Coast Guard situation over the last five years, I've like, I, I, I'm committed. I love going up, you know, I love going up, but like I got to know 
through a friend. We found out that we had a mutual friend, but one of the guys at Red, he's like, hey, dude, we're going to hire you. I can't guarantee you anything in the winter. I was like, ugh, well, that means I have to move up to Ellensburg. You know, I have to get a place up in Ellensburg. You can't guarantee me hours. I mean, I get that. I'm low man on the totem pole. Been there, done that before, you know. But I'm like, here's the other thing in my mind. I already know, you know, I'm going back up to Alaska. And when I leave in June, like, that's the heart of your guys' season in Reds, you know. Like, I'm like, I, who I am as a worker, I can't leave you guys in the middle of your season. It's it's not fair to you guys, you know. I mean, yeah. I know you probably work out something, but I, I, I just – it's not who I am. It's not how I work. You know, uh, if I'm going to do something, it's like a hundred percent. And the, the guy was like, yeah, dude, I, I appreciate that. You know, I understand that because he used to get up there and that, you know, one of my, you knew my, my buddy. And, uh, it was, uh, it was one of those things understandable. I'm like, if the doors ever open again, you know, if I decide to call it quits up there, I'll, I'll let you know if you got a spot, you know, if I stay in the Washington area, one of my other buddies is in Montana. It's like, Hey, don't go up. Come, come over to Montana. I'm like, coin flip come on ah, it sounds fun man you know but um it, it's it's hard to say no because it's so it's peaceful it's beautiful um can't beat the fishing you know i mean i know it's kind of kind of a different in a way a different type of fi- fishing because I, I feel like those fish up there like especially where, where, where i'm at and probably same where kyle's at um they have they have three to four months to feed, you know, between when 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 the snow melt comes off, and so they're they're feeding, man. They're, it's like they're aggressive. They know their time frame, you know. And it's not like down here on the on the Yakima where <laughs> they see if and everything and what everybody has, and see it five times a day with you know twenty boats going over a section, you know. Um, I mean, so it's different, and and. That's the one reason why I love fishing down here is because I'm learning down here constantly, you know. Um, some things work, some things don't. Um, but, you know, I've always kicked around. I, I don't know if this is going to be my last year up there. I don't know what holds. I, I do that year by year. I've been looking um, looking at, at places. I, this past winter, I went through two interviews with the uh, Upqua Feather Merchant to go work work up there to go try to do something different and they they gave the job to somebody else and i'm just like i appreciate the two interviews it's your loss not mine i'm willing to move willing to pick up and relocate and i think that was one thing that they were a little bit afraid of but um i'm more more than thankful going through two interviews to the, to the place you know especially yeah. being like one of the two two or three places i applied this winter to go try to change my lifestyle i would like to stay in the industry you know because i love it whether it's fly fishing, whether it's, uh, um, whether it's in, in the gear sector of it. Um, I just, I like the industry. I like the people that I've met. I'm appreciative of people who I've learned from that. That's the other thing of being in there for so long. I've got to learn from two or three people that have been up there for in, in, in the, in the Alaska scenery mm-hmm. all over the place for, that probably been up there now pretty pushing pretty close to 25 to 30 years um now one guy spent spent some time in your area kyle by the name of ty wyatt um and now he's doing a lot of stuff down in in, in the southeast doing he transitioned from being just strictly like a king guide on the kenai and to doing you know kings on the nushagak to doing trout on the gula walk with gci to now i think he's i think he's at like yakutat bay or something like that and or Glacier Bay, something, one of those two down there. And he's doing halibut. He's like, dude, I never thought about me loving saltwater, but I, I love this fishing, you know, and, and being the captain of the boat and doing all that stuff and, and, and taking people out that way. And then another guy that's from Washington, Ty, I don't remember. Ty, I think he's from, from Oregon, Oregon or Vancouver, one of the two. The other guy that I've learned quite a bit for the last two years that have been up there for quite a bit is Doug McWilliams. I think he, Keaton, I think he's in that fly fishing uh, that where, where we reached out to each other, and uh, yeah. he'd been all over the the uh, the Bristol Bay area and uh, up there, and he just diehard fly junkie. And you know, I used to dry fly fishing and, and doing a little bit of the nymph fishing there, and and then he he brings a mouse over, and I'm like, I you know I've heard people saying you know getting one or two, and he's 
got his rhythm and mouse fishing. So I'm like looking, watching, like, mm-hmm, so, so what are you doing here? You know, mm-hmm, you know, yeah. just taking, taking all this information in that, you know, whether I use it down here or whether, whether, whether I use it up there, it's just been, and then obviously Bob Kratz or who's at his time through the eighties up there and, 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 and all the way and all his experience, you know, with him being one of the guys that founded twitching. I mean, I don't know if you twitch for cohos and stuff like that. He, he kind of stumbled into that and was one of the, I, I can't say he truly is the founder, but he's kind of one that I think helped put it on the map. Um, Thanks. Um, but it's learning from him and, and doing that and, and, and just the people that you meet, whether it's clients, whether it's the other people that you're with, that you're working with. We have another guy that's been up there for a while this year. I haven't met him yet, but I've, I've, a couple of people that I've worked with before they work with them. They say he's a hoot. So I'm looking forward to that guy. He's fished all over the world, you know? Um, yeah. Got friends that guide in Montana, I got outfits in Montana that's come up and done a half a season. Um, got another buddy that I got to, got to work with for a season up there. And he's got his own thing in Florida and does stuff in Louisiana. Another guy that's directly in Louisiana um, and watching their fisheries and see what they're doing and people from all over the world, you know? Yeah. That's really cool. So let me kind of, you've gone, we've gone and we've learned a lot about the your years and, Sounds like you have a lot of experience and different type of experience. Um, but let me go back to kind of the beginning. How was being a like a camp hand? How did that benefit you even, you know, in your early days of guiding and now in your later days of guiding? How did those experiences being just around the camp uh, make your guiding experience even like more pleasurable? Um. I think, I think, you know, like, I think it helps being at the kind of having clients know who you are, you know, from picking them up at the airport. And and then eventually they're like, oh, well, he's not here. He's not picking me up. And then all of a sudden they're like, go up. Let's just use a togiak, for example. Next thing you know, I'm there waiting at a boat to go take them. Oh, man, cool. You've worked your way up, you know. And so, I mean, I think it, I think it would say it takes a little bit of pressure off because, you know, you, some of your returning guests, you already, you already know, and they know who you are. Um, but, but I think also like kind of slowly transitioning into it, you know, um, and not having any guiding experience whatsoever and watching however people do and pick, pick other people's brains and be like, okay, man, so what do you do here? Um, yeah. uh, this is what I'm doing. Um, is it right or is it wrong? You know, like, I remember even doing like the king fishing. I've never, never ran a diver in eggs. I've seen it. I've seen it done. I've never ran it. I didn't know the speed to do it. I didn't, I went right by, right by Kratzer being green. Not even think about it. I'm like, Hey, am I doing this right? Like he's literally in the boat next to me. Right. And he's like, what? Like later that night, he's like, dude, why are you saying that across? You're like, I don't know. I'm trying to learn at the same time, you know? So he's like, yeah, man. Like, he's like, he's like, he's like, you know, in the future, you have questions, you know, don't do it out there on the water. We're trying to, <laughs> like, you know, um, you can ask me, at, you know, at the end of the day, you know, so it, I think I got, I got to learn a little bit and see, but, you yeah. know, I, I'm more of a kinesthetic learner. I got to do it. Yeah. But I think I've also adapted to the visual learning process this way. Um, yeah. Cause like you and I, Keaton, we were talking the other night, like I, I, after looking at the rig and, and doing some rig of your, of your 90 degree nip. Uh, yeah. I, I, I've seen it now, you know what I mean? Like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I've, have I ever ran it? No. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like seeing it, you know, setting it up and, and stuff like that, like learning that way, watching how everything seems, you know, um, some people pr- primarily use certain, dry flies where i'm at you know and yeah and now that, you know it's like everybody's throwing throwing caddises for a caddis hatch and i'm like well you know what i know they know they catch them on um this back home guys let's just try this okay yeah. i don't know anybody throwing chubby nobles up there in alaska <laughs> yeah i was throwing i was throwing like four like 14s i think maybe maybe 14 as long, maybe 12s. I can't remember what they were. I, I bought a whole bunch of Trevor Nobles to during the pandemic to go throw on the Yakima. I had them in my box. I'm like, let's 
let's try it. You know, what, what's yeah. worse? We're going to catch some grail and, you know, I got found the right size that they would take and dude, everybody's, Oh dude, this is awesome. You know, like I, I can't believe they're taking that big ugly thing off the surface. You know, it just, you just get to the point where, you, you know, people have done something like I, like I used Doug, for example, like with the mouse fishing. I know they talked about doing mouse fishing. My dad talked about doing it on, on the connect talk where he guided. What I, I look at the structure on the gula walk and I'm like, I don't, that river's too big. There's no, there's no boulder dams. There's no nothing. Those fish aren't looking at that. Nope. You get the right twist, the right action. You know, you're not going to get a lot on the Google walk, but you're going to get them to come up and nose it or anything like that. So watching those guys and, 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 and learning from kind of, you know, this kind of sounds bad, but like, you know, I have I didn't get to spend a lot of time in the boat with, with Doug fishing mice, but they're like, Oh, we did this with Doug. And you're like, okay. Tie on a mouse. And, they're like, get it. And like, oh, hey, do that again. Let me see what you're doing. You know? <laughs> Learning you know? from me. Oh, okay. I get it now. Yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, smart you learn, man he is. <laughs> you know? You learn, you learn from your clients. I mean, every day, like, you can learn something else from, I mean, you go out fishing as much as we, like, we teach them the basics, kind of where to go and stuff. I mean, I learn from clients as well. Like, oh, I, I do it this way usually when I'm fishing or and you're like, oh, I've never actually thought about that. I'm going to try that. And the next thing you know, it's in your <clears throat> in your toolbox. So, but <clears throat> would you say that when you're up there too, um, did you, did you kind of, I guess you kind of learned the way of life before you got out into the guiding scene too, right? I mean, you talked about like filleting fish. How was that? You know, do, did you do a lot of filleting before that or? Or uh, I, I always hear a lot of like camp hands go up there and they said that's like the, the hardest part for them at first is just getting through like their first couple salmon to get a good fillet out. You know, prior to that, I, I did a little bit of, you know, like trout, you know, you're more you're just gutting them, you know. Yeah. I filleted a couple, probably a couple of salmon, steelhead back when, when we could keep them back in the 90s, you know. Um, but I, I didn't I didn't do too much playing. I mean, growing up my dad loved to do all that stuff that was my dad's thing you know and as you know like a 10 12 13 year old kid you know my dad wants to do it you know okay yeah. my dad never my dad was never never a big pushy person and being like okay here you're gonna do this you know what i mean like you know he, he, he wanted me to to look at it and be like okay do you want to do it okay i'm here to help you but you know at first you, you're kind of like oh you know i think i think even you don't do it all the time you get up there and you do your first one, you know, you go slow, but you still kind of butcher it a little bit, but yeah, I, I, a lot of guys, you know, work with some work with guys from Michigan that are, you know, or from Georgia or, or, or even like Texas, you know, they don't have salmon. They don't know where to start. You know, I, I think a couple of guys, you know, from the, from the South that they never filleted a fish like that, you know? So like us, we're, we're a hundred percent, used to it you know and you know so you got to teach them the basics or you know if somebody does not everybody fillets the fish the same way right you know people gut it and then go through that way and then peel it off the bones so i i originally learned the butterfly fly method and and did that so you know i mean yeah. and then over the years you you find okay what what's the best way to get back in the plane you know so you'll just cut it out and then debone it and it takes a while to to get that craft in you know yeah and you know sometimes like at the king camp we just had had stations you know and you know so i didn't get the i didn't i filleted some kings but i didn't because they knew i had knew how to handle the whole like vacuum packing room from my experience of camp handing they had me up there running that you know what i mean like making sure everything like one of the things i don't think a lot of people realize but like one of the things that was drilled in my head for any apparent reason is when you put, when you vacuum pack that fish, like you want that to be as best as possible up there. Cause that's the last thing they see from their trip. Like if, if, the, if they keep fish, right. Yeah. That's their last memory. So if it looked ugly or if there's dirt in the fish, if there's anything like that, right. You come back and like, Oh man, this is, this is bad. Does that, does that reflect back to what, how they think of the trip or whether it be like, Oh, dude, that's a nice fillet. Right that is just one of the things that I've always lived and learned by. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, 
so I didn't get to do a whole lot of kings. I did a lot of silvers, you know. I still do a lot of silvers, still do a lot of sockeye. But yes, and to answer your question, you know, the you know the steps and steps of you know like just filleting fish and, and, and doing that stuff has helped in the long run, and you know, not so much pressure, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> so when you know you, you talked about too, you've been to a lot of different areas of Alaska. It sounds like. Um, did you find a lot of similarities like in the fishing method methods uh, as you traveled around to different parts of Alaska or did you feel like you had to uh, change up a lot or learn something new every time you went somewhere else? I think um, every place is going to have something different. I think um, I, uh, we had a, like, um, I think king fishing, depending on, on, on the, the places that you go, um, some of it depends on the equipment that they provide for guides. Um, I, I, know, I know at Mission Lodge, there was a lot of spinner fishing down there in the tidal water. Um, and we at Kingfishers, when I was there, we pulled a lot. We did some spinners when, my first couple of years there, but we also pulled a ton of plugs um, and then we did a lot of, uh, um, dragon and bobber dogging, you know, uh, down the road, um, for fly fishing wise, um, there, there's always certain patterns that work in certain places, um, in certain time of year, uh, you know, I, I think your bead styles and stuff like that. I think that is fairly simple. Um, it sucks now that the uh the one nail polish has disappeared completely from everywhere that everybody used you know back when i first got up there and they're like don't matter just just swirl this one on there you know and uh you know <laughs> but for like i know there's one streamer pattern that i use on the gula walk that even guys who will let and like oh dude we killed them on the gula walk this and they go take them over to the Quee Jack and just the way that pattern is does not produce like it does on the Gula Walk, you know, yeah. or the Knack Knack, you know, it, the regular, you know, the regular style bunny leech that, that they do works way better, you know. Um, I think also the style of guide could change too. I mean, because I know one of the guys that I, that, that I learned – a lot from and I think he's in Oregon now but I mean he he just had a brain for I'm just going to do this well you know the water got high you know and we use San Juan worms back home I'm going to tie a you know a three inch purple worm and we he fished the upper Nushagak with that and 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 however he tied him for steelhead I know he tied a one up there for the peninsula that was killer for swinging um but like some guys will just, oh, I'm just going to stick to nymph fishing, you know, and, and stick with hares, ears, pheasant tails, because that's your main go-to, you know. Um, but, I, you know, like I, I got, like I said earlier, like when it came to, to mouse fishing, I, I look at the gula walk and I'd be like, well, yeah, no, we caught a couple. But, like, I hear from people who fish the Connect Talk, I haven't been to that one. That That's, that's my dream river to go to, by the way. You've heard me say it a couple times. That's where my dad was. I want to spend at least a week on there just to say I have because my dad was on there, you know. Um, but they do a lot of mousing on the Connect Talk and just probably more your structure through the braids and, and the log jams, you know. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, you have your basic patterns. But then again, I think it suits whoever the guide is because it's like one year – or Doug's first year, Doug McWilliams first year up there. There's a point in time where I got off of throwing streamers because I was the streamer nut for a while and, and and he was kicking butt with dry flies. And I'm like, guys, like, what do you guys want to do? I tell my clients that, well, we did this with such and such. I go, so you guys want to dry fly fish? Okay. So I had to go keep up with Doug on his dry fly fishing. Next you know, him and I are both, all these guys are, you know, lodges are just nymph fishing and we're sitting there throwing dry flies and just buying a quarter of a mile section where they're just popping off on dries and everybody's floating by us. Like, what are they doing? You know? Yeah. I think that's, I think that's the other thing. Um, 
with when I know I went back and saying learning from people is as much knowledge as I've taken in, it, it's becoming more adaptable to situations. I, one of my longtime clients at, at Bear Claw, she's gone up she, with me and actually where, where um, we went tarpon fishing together in Florida with, with one of my buddies and split her trip there. And she came up the first week last year and she loves throwing dry flies. Well, everybody was nymph fishing and wasn't doing anything. And I could watch the surface boil. I'm like, why aren't you guys even just throwing, you know, caddises, parachute atoms or anything like that? And we're like, you know, and I, I think one of the biggest things is being, being willing to adapt and listen to people. Yeah. I know that's a little bit more than what your question was, but. Oh, that's, that was perfect. That's some and, great information for sure you know, you kind of mentioned like, oh, one pattern works great here and one pattern doesn't work great here. I mean, I think you can apply that to most fisheries. Like, I mean, they're even like the simple change from like fishing in the Eastern Washington river to coming to like a Western Washington river. It's just crazy how like the size you change up the size or the color, but it's the same pattern, you know, how, you you can end up catching fish but like not everything is going to work everywhere even if they have the same hatches happening in the same time every river system's a little different so i had that experience this year up in alaska um throwing some stuff that i thrown on the yakima you know in much smaller you know like size 16 and i think you know four. 14 or maybe it was even yeah size size 16 i think it was 14 or 12 that i was throwing up there in alaska made the difference you know so yeah oh, for sure and like one of my my one of my favorite grayling patterns is a size 12 squall of stonefly and i've never seen a squall of stonefly up here in alaska but i threw it on and they love it so i have my dad tie me up a whole bunch of them you just you never know you always got to try uh, something different it's, it's amazing how profile is, you know, and, and, you know, like when you're talking about learning stuff, like all the time, you know, and I, I hear guys, I haven't done it. I kind of wish I would have done it over the years of, of, of my guiding career. And I heard guys that, I don't know if the word to say more serious than, than, than what I am, but like, there's guys that will take a daily, daily log of what they throw, how they did, what the temperature is. I've never done it. You know, I've just been, okay, we use this. If that doesn't work, go to the next thing in the box. Right. Um, But it was amazing to watch the contrast between, you know, just parachute atoms and and a, and a purple haze on on whatever day it was up there. And it's like, they're the same damn fly, you know, other than one's purple and one, you know, yeah, and just all about the, the profile and the lighting, that thing. And it, you know, I've you guys, everybody who's probably thrown anything that realizes that, you know, doing it, but it was just something that I was like, huh, okay, put that in the memory bank. So, for yeah. sure. So, you know, sorry, one more thing and then you can go. Um, you know, the one thing I, I, I've kind of learned is like when I go recreational fishing, like on like my time and I want to go out and explore, the best thing I've done is just like not tie anything on that has like been working for my clients. Right. Cause then that gives me time to figure out new stuff and I might find something that might be working that someone else might not know about. So. For sure. <clears throat> well, one thing that um, I wanted to jump back to real quick and ask you, Stephen, is about why you decided to stop guiding and why you wanted to take that break and try to find something else. Like, was there, was there a driving force behind that? We just wanted to change a pace. What, what, what was the reasoning there? Um, I think, I think with, with, with my ex-girlfriend leaving me, um, it was kind of like kind of an eye opener because I, I, I've seen people, you know, up there in Alaska to go through this, while they were in Alaska getting broken up or cheated on or any, anything like none of that ever happened, happened with me. It just, you know, just go different ways. And, uh, but just one of those things was, is, is that the direction that I want to go? You know, like, do I want to start a family? Do I want to do this? Do I want to go do a desk job or do I want to, you know, do I want to try something different? And it is 
probably one of the hardest things, you know, decision making. It it's hard to say no because of the investment I think that you made, that you made to go up there and then the people that you connect with up there and then i i tell people this this may sound bad but like for things that i've done down here like dealing poker it's a great mental break um just to go up there and, and and not have the weight of a lot of the stuff that you do down here in the lower 48 you don't i i hate cell phones i hate I hate technology. It's really not my thing. I'm, I'm in my phone a lot because it's there. That's how I communicate. That's how I communicate, communicate with family members a lot. Um, but my first couple of years, like, yeah, we had cell phones, but we'd turn them off and we'd throw, throw them in a, in a, in a bag and we'd call home on a calling card on a landline right up there. And those were probably some of the most peaceful times. Now we got internet. Now we got this and I can, order make an order purchase i don't have to worry about having everything up there or bring anything to tie to come up there um but you know just you don't have, you didn't have to worry about your everyday life down here if that makes sense um especially i mean like i know kyle you're a little bit more in a civilization atmosphere but like when i'm out there in in, in the bristol bay region i mean we have a small town that we 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 can um we can fly into and then we're, I'm going now I'm, I'm still going, you know, 30 miles from that little town, which they do have cell service now, but we didn't have, didn't have to worry about everything back home. And that was probably one of the best mental breaks that you can. And you come back and you're rejuvenated you going to school, you know, now life's changed. And, and, and I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, start doing my own thing now. Um, and, you know, I love it up there. As long as I, as long as I have that, I don't don't have any other responsibilities other than myself. I can see myself going up there, but at, at my, uh, I, I'm still young enough. But I tell people when you start getting out there doing the doing the bush guiding stuff, it it is a young man's game. I mean, like, no, hundred percent. You know, like I started out, you know, helping put motors in in airplanes, lifting wrong there. You know what I mean? Um, trying to slide things out of an airplane with the motor, going step down, step down to a float and onto a dock. Um, I didn't, I didn't have any worries, but I mean, I didn't care about, about my health back then, you know? Um, and then like moving, setting up tent poles and stuff like that and, and, and moving other things. I still move a little bit of motors, not as much now, which I hand that off to some of the younger guys um, and, and point not to say point fingers. I'm, I'm not, I still don't really consider myself a, a, a chief. I still, you know, I still, you know, help out and do all that stuff. That's just who I am. I don't try to do anything that I don't think I don't have them do anything that I don't think I can do, but um, I, I, I got to look out for myself at some point in time. And, and, and I've been kicking around. Um, I didn't mention any of this to you guys, but about two weeks ago, I, I wrecked my beautiful, beautiful Dodge. Um, I, uh, I, I clipped it. We had a big, uh, windstorm and I clipped the back end trying to pass a semi, I clipped the back end of semi. And so my, my whole passenger side of my Dodge got ripped off and, and all that stuff. So I had to go make some adjustments and go get a different car. And I don't have health insurance. I don't, the jobs I work, I don't have to have health insurance or I haven't had health insurance. I work seasonal jobs, you know, um, I can go work some things, but I do love Alaska. So it's kind of been one of those things in the back of mind that maybe I got to, I got to move on for the best interest of my health. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and, and go and get the, that, that benefit. And that's probably the one, one thing that will make me hundred percent be like, okay, I've done this enough. I'm not going to, I would love to be 50 and still doing it, but it's also, you know, if I decide to have kids, if I decide to have, a family. It's one thing I've said from day one, I go, if I, if I have that, any other responsibilities other than myself, and then it, it's done, it's over with. It's been a hell of a ride, you know? Um, I, that there, just to jump to, to, to something else, I, there's one other thing that I kind of put in the title of being a guide up there in Alaska. Um, and people ask me what to do. I go, one thing I, I like to do, and, and, and I did mention being like well-rounded and stuff like that. I go, I go, I, I try to be somebody's dream maker for that trip. People are paying, you know, 
tons of money to come up and spend a week with you. You know, if somebody wants to go pike fishing, if somebody wants to do the most boring thing that you, that you think is the boring, I suck it up and do it. You know, whether, whether I had a kid last year, never caught a pike. Him and his dad went up to Canada to purposely catch pike, never caught a pike in like the five days that they were there. I spent half a day trying to get this kid a pike in our little pike hole, you know, and they've already been hit like two weeks and he's like, dude, this is the best day of my life. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like I'm a dream maker. Okay. That's the best way I can tell you that I, I do the job. I don't, I don't do it for me. I do it for the other people. So for sure. Very well said. And I, I agree, man. Um, a lot of the guys that I guide with up here, um, single dudes, they're young, physically capable. Um, and it, cause it's rough on you. Uh, physically sometimes mentally and especially um, if you were to have an, a dependent for you you have a family you have kids uh, it is difficult I'm married I have two cats uh, we run a house uh, it's it is tough um, to to do that um, I can I definitely see where a lot of guys um, you're single dude no responsibilities super great job um, I've been lucky to have a supportive, uh, supportive wife, supported family, um, who helped me to continue to guide, but that it is, I, it's definitely something that you're young, you have the opportunity, go do it before you do get tied down. Cause it, it makes it more difficult. It's not impossible, but it definitely makes it more difficult. You know, um, go ahead, Keaton. The other side of that note too it's like you also only got one life to live so it's like you got to do what you love you know i, I and you, i hope like the people around you can support what you love right like you're gonna have to make some sacrifices and stuff so i mean i think a lot of people get caught up in like oh i'm getting married i gotta stop guiding i gotta stop doing this but like if you're really passionate about it maybe you're not doing it as much but you still can be doing it you know like just just that that's kind of the other side of the coin the way i look at it you know i think a lot of people get caught up in that and they're like oh, i got this and that it's like but if you love it don't don't leave it because that'll make like your soul feel kind of like shit what am i doing here you know mm-hmm. so for sure Sorry to just flip. The, I, I just had to flip the coin because it was all like, ah, oh, I was a young man. It's like, oh. no, guys, come on. No, for sure. No, I'm, I'm glad so, you brought that up because I mean, uh, like, yeah. Go for it, Steve. Uh, no, no, you're good. Go for it. I, I was going to say, I, I, I joke with some of the guys up there, you know, some of the guys that are full time lower 48 guides, you know. I go, I, I personally think there's a difference in work ethic between lower 48 guides and, and what I call bush guides or Alaska guides. We, we do a lot mm-hmm. of grunt work. Um, guiding wise, I do think it's um, up there. It's truly probably almost 80% entertainment, you know, and then the rest is, you know, be, mixed between mental and, and, and like custom customer service and, and, and fishing because up there you're stuck with, that's the wrong word to say because I do enjoy all my 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 clients' company, but you're stuck in the same spot. You can't get off the boat ramp, shake the guy's hand, and say either I'm going to see you tomorrow or you know I'll see you next year or I'll see you in in, in two weeks. However time he books, you know I I'm there. Like you're also the other thing I say is yes, you're off off the clock t- technically, but you're on the clock twenty four seven. Like if there's something, you 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 better be prepared, you know, and and I, I kind of give some of my buddies who who guide down here, you know, lower forty. I'm going, oh man, you, I can't believe you're up here doing this because you you know you sandbag a little bit, you know, like just just joshing them a little bit. But there is a little bit to it where some of them take a lackadaisical approach because it's just a vacation trip for them. Um, they love it, but they don't see it as the as as the entertainment factor as I do, because it's just a, you know, another stop for them to take a vacation and, and make money doing it. To me, it's something that I love to do and entertainment factor of it, you know, of entertaining the clients, 
being the host. I think I got that from my dad talking about entertaining clients and, and trying to make it their trip. Don't matter if I guided them two years prior, the last year, three years, whenever they come up or it's their first time. Um, and the ones, I, this is kind of off topic a little bit. The ones that are very, very, very special to me are father and son trips. Mm -hmm. I, for everything that Bob Kratz has done and my dad has done for me on those trips from catching my first steelhead to being joshing around in the boat, just growing up, doing all that stuff. I feel like I get to return the favor. So those are prob those, those are probably my favorite, favorite trips and probably the ones that I, 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 t I can't say cater more to, but the ones that I, I feel that are, are special, you know what I mean? Like trying to watch, watch some, some dad trying to entertain his kid and, 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 and stuff like that. You know, I, I have some other great stories sitting there guiding if you guys ever want to hear those sometimes about watching get dads pick on kids and stuff like that. And me Josh and back and playing games with, with, with people in my boat about like the lunch rule, every thought was dumb. And, you know, like, Oh, you're doing that wrong. Hey dude, how come he's catching a fish? You know, but it's th those things. It's just special. Those are special times for me because feel like it's a it's it's a pay it forward i guess you can call it that way pay it forward repaying something like that yeah heck yeah no, i totally agree if somebody is interested in coming up and going to alaska um what what are your suggestions for that and then kind of leading that into um looking for guides and and what you're looking for in a person um, so uh, I think a lot of places always, always are looking for guides, especially in the, uh, um, let's say that at the turn of the year, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of guys, I know, I know Rob, you know, starts kind of like making the phone call December-ish and then kind of confirming January, if you're going to return, Sometimes it feels like it's early, especially, you know, when you're not sure what you're going to do or, you know, trying to look at other jobs, you know, Hey, I'll get back to you by this date, you know? Um, but so a lot of guys are looking, looking for guys like that turn of the year where they're trying to get things rolling. Um, um, but the, one of the major re requirements for Alaska and, and is you got to make sure if it's navigable water, you got to have a, a coast guard license. Um, I know I mentioned I'm, going through the renewal process and I've been through the renewal process like that. Um, if you're down here in the lower 48, I, from my experience, I think the best thing to do is just to man up and go through the two week class, to get your six pack. Um, instead of just doing the, like, I, I think I mentioned it as well earlier, just like the, the, the Bristol Bay or just this portion of Alaska or whatever. Um, and I think it, it opens it up to you being able to go to a little bit, a little bit more of a, of an area like Southwest. I think you can do, I think you could still do a little bit of uh, saltwater fishing. I think you can go near coastal with it. Um, and then you can also, you know, probably do a couple sounds cause I don't think they're that far off. I'm not a hundred percent positive. I haven't dipped into that portion of it, but gotta have the coast guard license. Um, I mean, I think everybody looks for somebody with experience, but I think you also have that, that, that part of where, you know, if you find the right place, they're going to train you and they're going to train you to do what, what, what their outfit is meant to do, whether it's, you know, like, like us, we start out sockeye fishing and trout fishing and then we transition. Um, and most of you guys, that most of your head guides are been there for three or four years, two or three years. So um, some of them might be old grouchy guy that just goes up there every single year and you might not get any information out of them. He might just go, I'll go do this. But, you know, um, a lot of guys, you know, I try to communicate with everybody. So, like, you get guys that, hey, what are you doing? How are you doing this? You know, like I even asked um, a buddy that I've, I, I've talked to off and on that works for the uh, GCI. I asked him, I go, hey, dude, like, I don't feel like my nymphs are getting down. What is your leader link? You know, I asked him. He's like, hey, dude, we're doing this. You know, oh, sweet. You know, hey what are you doing with this on your dry flies? Hey, I'm doing this, you know, like we're not even on the same company, you know, but it's one of those things. I mean, like we, we do stuff together. Like we take their guys sometimes over kingfish. And so I feel like they're part of my team, you know, but, um, 
we, uh, you know, we're, we look for, I think they look for guys that, that have experience down here guiding in the lower 48. I think it's easier that way because they know how to, how to handle handle the, the the like situations in the boat with clients. So you don't have too many situations. You have a couple people a year in the three months that a couple guys could be a pain, you know. Um, I don't know. I can't say for every other place, but we don't typically allow alcohol out in the boat just for safety reasons. Yeah up there you know uh i think some of those waters up there in alaska are a little quicker than down here in the lower 48 with that early runoff so that's one of those things um just trying to you know how to handle your clients in certain situations um work ethic is a i I think work ethic is a big thing um i know some places just try to feel people but um I, i try to i've been through all this it's been like a team effort um doesn't matter if you're the cook doesn't matter if you're housekeeping doesn't matter if you're a manager doesn't matter if you're a pilot we all work together to make make the make the week for somebody make the make the situation we all have our roles and if those roles don't fulfill or complete or line up we're not doing something right so we're a team effort i i know it's a little different like where we're at, like at, and I know some places they do their own tips, but we've always pulled our tips here. And I know some people ask about that, but so I've always worked in the team atmosphere and it's not been me, 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 you know, if any of my guys needs help, um, if, uh, something's not working, you know, like, Hey, I have this, like if your guys really want to, you know, I, I, I don't, I know we get, I know this is kind of off tangent, but I know like we have our own selection of flies you know like that the lodge provides i've played the games over a couple of years where guys hoard things i just say i'm just setting off you know a few hundred of my own bucks and go out and buy a bunch of flies for for the season you know if i go through them i go through them and mm. then like you know some guys don't don't know what streamers to bring up or don't have the material to tie the streamers i'm like here who take them out of my streamer box my guys don't want to throw streamers today if i need them to put them on I'll steal my streamer box back from you or take the streamers at some point in the day. So teamwork, team effort, team player, I, I say is crucial in that atmosphere, especially when you're being with a group of guys for three months to four months of the year um, and being away from home, it helps. Um, I've been in places where it hasn't been like that, um, you know, and you just try to, try to avoid that type of person. But um, back on track, excuse me sorry um i think um you know we we talked about being able to physically lift some stuff i know people over the years have gotten smarter my my dad talks about rolling 55 gallon drums up out of the boat on the riverbank up to a fuel tent i've ran hoses pumping you know fuel out of boats and, and stuff like that and everybody's getting to much safer much easier little work but being able to physically do some stuff won't hinder you if you can't do it. But I think it also helps to be able to lift, lift, I'd probably say up to 50 to 60 pounds on, you know, at the most, I don't work as a partner to lift something, anything heavier. You know what I mean? Don't be macho, man. I told a kid that was a camp hand that we were moving a whole bunch of lumber this past year. And he, we're like, oh, dude, you're softening up. Just joking with the young guy, you know. I, I guided him in his camp for years. Um, and he was doing a campaign work at the Kingfishers. And I'm like, dude, and, he, like, and then he's sitting there trying to pick up three. The next one, I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to have this man-to-man talk. You don't have to prove anything out here. You have a whole season of hard lifting work, you know. So just do what you can, but it's not going to limit you. I mean, they're going to find something if, if you can't do it, you know. Um, but it helps, you know, you don't put all the weight on one person. Um, I think if, I mean, I know I'm not, I'm not the best tire in the world, but I mean, it's like you being out on the whim, if you're out at out camp and be able to tie things, so that, that helps out quite a bit having that knowledge. Um, and one of the, one of the funniest things for me to ever to do that I haven't done anything with. You know, if you can row a boat before getting up there, it helps. I mean, 
if, if you have never done it, they're going to train you to do it no matter what. Cause I've, you know, some of those guys, you know, either done float tubes or done bank fishing, you know, and we've had guys learn to row a boat there on top, but it, it helps if you, if you're taking a class to row a boat. Yeah. Was there any other questions along that, that I missed guys? No, uh, no that's really good. <laughs> I think you covered it pretty much uh, all and kind of going back on your, your, your statement of being the macho man out there. It's like, I was just thinking when you, you were saying that, I was like, man, if you hurt yourself out there, it's like you don't got a doctor just down the road from you, you know? And like, and same with like your responsibility for your clients. If your clients drink and fall out of your boat, it's not like I can just call the, you know, the sh- local sheriff office to come out in their sled and pick my clients up. So but, uh, a lot more responsibility. Cra- crazy story. One of the guys that I worked with, one of his first guided trips up in Alaska, he's from California. He had a guy, uh, it was, I want to say it was somewhere like up by Anchor Point. And this is how he tells the story, but a gal fell out of her boat and got trapped in a in a lockdown. And he had to break her arm on one of his like first weeks of guiding up in Alaska oh. to get her out. And he's like, holy cow, like all that stuff. And like, they're like, oh, thank you. You saved, saved her life. You, you know, middle of nowhere, right? Like, it's fell out of the boat, whatnot. You know, I have guys that have been up there for 12 years and have people, other people running up a river and make the mistake and take a boat up in shallow water and end up in a bigger boat going sideways. And he has to put the whole entire boat up on the beach because he has nowhere to go or he's going to go right into somebody. I mean, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's incidents. I mean, I've been pretty fortunate. My rule of thumb is don't ever put um, yourself in a situation that you don't get out of with clients. If it's just myself, sure. I've gone back to the, you know, the braids and jump logs and stuff like that and, and boats. Um, but I ain't, no, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to have to answer to that, that to, to my boss or anything, you know, um, there's times to have fun. There's times to screw around with the guys, but same time you still have to be professional. You know what I mean? So, um, but yeah, there's, I've heard some crazy stories about like, you know, people, you know, getting too drunk or anything like that, falling out of the boat, being being problems. I mean, I I kind of like equipment to last. And, you know, you guys, guides, people don't realize it and they drop, you know, a $200 rod or, you know, $200 reel on, on, the, on the bow of the boat, you know, or just if you do a creek hike, they drop it on the ground. Like, Ugh, that will, uh, I'm glad, I'm glad I used that one just for clients. You know, I'm glad it's not, not, not mine, you know, like my, yeah. my, you know, like $300 reel and, and $500 rod or whatever, you know, but you know, people up there, you know, like sometimes just get in the moment and they're not, they're not thinking that way. And so you got to be alert, you know, and uh, I know Kratzer told me one time rowing a boat is, you know, and I, I've been, very fortunate you know I, I don't row down here very much i have a bunch of friends that row me everywhere and, and especially Those rivers that i have for sure you know yeah yeah you know I, even if i have to pay for their service because it's their time i don't want to take them i always told my buddies i'm like hey if you have somebody that you know willing to pay more money to do it bump me out let me know you know i want you to make money i want you to be, keep doing this you know but you know the river i don't you know I'm, i'll come up i'll pay you for your services you know and uh and like he says, it's a matter matter of time for somebody to make a mistake and dump a boat. You know what I mean? Like it's going to happen, you know, if you're out there long enough, you know, and you hear about it. I mean, what was it last, last October? You've had one. Yeah. I flipped the boat last year with clients in it. Oh, I mean, I mean I, the cool walk is I've hit rocks and I've hit, hit, couple of rocks one where some gal's hat fell out of the boat and i the only rock i can hit in that one point in time i turn and bump and i i'm the one that almost went out of the boat you know mm. i did get her hat back you know low water the other one the water was low and going across the lake and i just totally forgot about the shelf and i cut across and i about put myself out of the boat there clients were fine rolled over they were laughing what happened oh god that rock but you know like it's a fear of mine. I don't think up in a, up where I'm at on the Gula walk, there's not that structure, but I think 
September, October, somebody did it on the Yakima up there by Ringer, you know. Yeah, not paying all attention, the time on the Yak. You know, my, I have family members that have, have property up there, um, uh, just up above Cleelum, and yeah. I floated a pontoon boat, and I think it was like Memorial Day weekend. I was, I went through there not knowing where I was going. I was stopping where I can to that look, watch, you know, where water was, and there's, there's full fledged trees load over with, you know, with root wads and stuff like there, you know, and it's getting water up there when, when they're not you know pumping any water out or anything like that and i'm getting ready to go and leave for alaska and memorial day weekend a couple floaters you know either drunk or something like that can't get out of the way get sucked up into those tree wads and one of them died like literally like mm-hmm. a mile from where you know i where my uncle's property was i'm like i just went by that i know exactly where it happened i can tell you where it was but it's just crazy you know i mean people i think people get comfortable you know, and I think that's where, where it's at. And I mean, I, I hate to say it, I'm comfortable in Alaska, but I, I just not sure that will be the place. I think more of me putting a hole in a boat, hitting a rock than dumping it up in Alaska. Now here, now fishing the yak or something like that, not paying attention or something like that, getting it up against the, the brush, unhooking a fish. I can see that happening to me, but you know, be aware of your surroundings. It, it's easy, you know? So the one thing I've learned from like uh, just kind of learning to row on the yak is it's like, there's even rocks that aren't waking the water, but they're like just big enough that they're just like right under there and you, you don't see them coming and you just boom. And you're dragging your, you hear it go <laughs> right across the bottom of your boat. And you're like, well, we might be swimming soon. Cause I couldn't oh. even see that. But especially in the fall, like the fall time is just, Oh yeah. Marley. That's and me. You, you wouldn't expect it. Yeah. I'm like, I don't expect it here at all. And then next thing you know, rock, rock, I, rock, rock. So it's just the way it goes. You just got to uh, close. I took off uh, last November right across from uh, Tam there, just below the bridge, knowing that there was a little pocket there that I was going to set up and have my buddy who's never fly fished before take some cash right there. He's like, Oh, rock. And I'm like, just underwater. Ooh, ooh, oh, well, okay. We'll just go around that one. You know, he's like, are you sure you know what you're doing? I'm like, dude, we're fine. <laughs> so no, it's, it's not, it's not like, it's not like the August when it's at, you know, like 30, 32, 3,500 feet flowing, you know? So yeah, nothing no. to worry about. You just right over the top of everything. There's like in some stretches, there's <laughs> the 50 things that you have to dodge in the fall. It's only down to like four things that you got to watch out for, which is just crazy. For sure. Kyle, speaking of, of like safety stuff like that up there, you know, if you do any sockeye fishing, do you have any guys waiting? Have you had any incidents or anything like that with clients, like just losing their feeding? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, not for sockeye, but I've had a gal go in um, last year on a wade trip. So where I guide, um, a guy, it's small water, uh, really brushy like you got cottonwoods and you got like, birch trees right over the water um where i flipped my boat i was actually in white water that was like class three class four kind of stuff mm-hmm. but um my gal last year wade trip i had this family i had three kids my age just graduated college like this is their college trip and um they had mom dad and like great auntie or something like that from i think dallas Texas. this girl shows up she's got like a long fake nails like a full face of makeup and we're waiting and she has like this open back like swooped back shirt and they're just like they're not ready to be fishing in alaska they're not ready to go anywhere in alaska and we get out to the river and we get out of this gravel bar it's me and the head guide and we're, we go through a casting clinic. We go through the rigs, what to look for, what we're doing. And this hole has the gravel bar that we're on. And there is a nice drop off, like probably a six, seven foot drop off. And there's a nice shelf leading up to it. That's like barely ankle deep. And we have to spread this whole family out of this gravel bar. And I have a couple people out in the water. I set up great auntie. I walk her to the very top of the hole. I just have her standing in like the less than ankle deep water. Cause I just want her to be there while I go set everybody else up, but she can just flail for a few minutes. 
like everybody out there, then go back to each person and teach them. I'm back there. One of the kids, I'm tying up, looking down. I hear some yelling. And I look up and I see this gal like, like yelling and kind of like waving her arms like, oh man, she must have a fish on. And so like set the hook, keep the rod tip up high. Um, don't, don't let them have any slack. Keep nice tension on it. And she starts like running down river. And I'm like, what the hell is she doing? And then I look and her rod tip is like in the water. And she's like, like using, like sweeping the rod tip back and forth under the water. And she's running downstream towards this drop off. Right. So less than ankle deep water. And she goes straight down to seven foot. And then from there on, you have just trees like growing into the water. So there's no way you're going to get out. And as I see this happen, I'm like, oh, shit. I throw everything down and I start like sprinting like as fast as I can in my waders across this gravel bar. I run into the river and the minute that I get to her, she goes from that ankle deep, boom, right into that hole. And she just like arms up in the air, boom, just straight down, like a hundred percent submerged. I'm like, fuck it. So I just keep running and I just start running into the river and I go straight off that drop off. I, I start to sink. I kick my legs up in the air so I can keep all my air in my waders and I sit up and I'm doing like a, like a crunch in the water. So no water's going down my back. My feet are still floating. She's like, like this, right? She's like underwater. I grab her by her armpit and I'm holding on to her. And I look back and I see the other guy running up to me and I start kind of like kicking and like backstroking to shore. And she's just like holding on to me for like, for dear life. I grab the other guy. He grabs my arm. He pulls me up to shore. We both grab her and pull her up. When I got out of the water, I had maybe like an inch of water in the bottom of my waders from that initial jump in, but she was, her waders were full up to her knees. Like if somebody hadn't had grabbed her right then, she was going to sink and then she was going to get swept into a log because that's, there was nowhere else to get out for another couple hundred yards. Damn. Super, super sketchy situation. Uh, uh, we, we don't have, we don't have much like brush or hang, overhang where, where I'm at like that, you know? I, uh, I had, uh, a gal step out of the boat in a little bit deeper water than when I'm like, okay, be careful. And she like lost footing and went over. She did it twice in a row. Wow. Um, insult, insult the injury there. I'm like, Oh God, <laughs> you know, they, 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 you know, they flew over from the King camp. So it wasn't like people that been there before and understand, you know, and then I, went to go unhook a, a, a sockeye rig from a spot where I told a guy not to cast, like he's up in the rock for this one little channel around an Island, you know, that we could, we could get to him. And I mean, I mean, it's moving pretty quick through there. And I was, I, I was probably, you know, up to my belly button and I'm only about five ten, you know, and the first time I, me being out there, you know, other than like jumping off a pontoon, uh, of a float plane and having the current sweep me over in front of my dad trying to show off, you know, and only getting like, like maybe like a foot section wet, you know, with waders and everybody's like, that's a nice save. I'm like, no, it's a dumb move. But like, mm -hmm. that's the only time I can say I've been swept off my feet while, you know, like trying to unhook this rig up. And I was, Phew. and the guy's like, Oh, look, you're floating. Like my client, you know, I'm like, dude, come on, man. Like, Luckily, like I could see down below that he's standing in water and finally got like just above and I put my feet down and I was up, you know, but, yeah. and then one of my, one of my, one of the guys has come up pretty much every, every year, every other year, he didn't come up last year. I think he had another trip planned, but he dodged, you know, some lead coming back from sockeye fishing and he was an older gentleman. So he went kind of like head over heels going back in, in, you know, thigh deep water. And we, we got him all wrung out and stuff like that. I had a buddy training somebody that they like hit a rock or something like that on a little shelf. And they went out to go fish this one. And he was like, went to go like jump out to throw the anchor out. And I don't know if he was concussed or something like that, but he ended up going face first. My buddy, my buddy said he ended up like, what the hell are you doing? Look down. He's like face first in the water and he reaches up and grabs him and he comes back up, you know, like this is one of our other guys like training, right? He's like, oh, God, he's like, oh, maybe we shouldn't do that, you know. Yeah. My other buddy called that, like, blackout rock or something like that. So one of those little things where it's like, uh, issues, you know, like, not too much. Never yeah. never had a bear charge at me for any reasons. I've had him walk and yell and, you know, like, two-year-olds and Chad had to school them off because they were like, uh. But, 
Yeah, no, no. I haven't had any major incidents, but I've heard, you know, a couple other people, like, not many, you know, boating incidents. I've had a couple of buddies that have been hit by some some folks running up river back to the village that, you know, probably had some booze on them and, and you know, they're floating, fighting a fish and guy just bunk, you know. Um, Crazy. Heard some nasty ones on the lower part of the Nushigak where people put a boat on top of a boat, you know, but nothing, nothing major where I could see it, you know. Yeah. That's sketch. I, uh, oh shoot. Which one was I thinking of? Oh, I've had, I haven't had any encounters with bears either. Um, but I had the same river I flipped on. We did helicopter trips on and on one of the overnights, our head guide was standing in the river fishing and he, he, he's off the bank and he hears this noise and he looks back and there's, I can't remember if it was one or two black bear cubs in the tree behind him. And he turns around and mom was right there, but she's like at the bank and she wouldn't go into the water after him. So he, and he didn't have his gun because he was right next to camp. He's like, bear, bear, bear. And the other guy came running up with his gun and they, the bears took off. But like, if he hadn't been in the water, I think she probably would have got him. Oh. And then the only other issues I've had are with moose. I remember last year, like late May, or early June, um, I had a cow and a calf. I was standing with one guy. We were fishing this hole. And I hear this sploosh, sploosh, sploosh. And I look up and there's a cow and a calf like 20 yards from me. And I'm like, oh shit. And I grab, I, I like, you got to go. And I grab him and I like jump into the water with him. And mama's standing there like, I could fuck you up if I want to. And then luckily the calf like turned and ran off. So she followed her calf. But then on the same river where we did helicopter trips, I, we, one of the clients, I think it was on like a week long trip, one of the last days. The guy is sitting on the shitter in the morning. It's the moose rut. And he gets chased off of the shitter by a bull moose that was trying to just kill him. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. That's a heck of a story. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, I never, I haven't actually been able to talk to him since then, like, like to get that story in person, but it sounded pretty damn funny. Oh, that's a shitty moment. You know what I'm saying? Oh man, I got, I got a lot of poop stories. On that one. <laughs> Dude, I got a lot of poop stories. We don't have enough time for all my poop stories, oh, but I got a lot of good poop stories. I I've I've been I've been where we stayed where we kept tents at the Kingfisher camp and we flew over and did like silver trips. And mm -hmm. we've had a couple bears get into the kitchen tent and stuff like that. So we stopped taking it down. But there's one time where we stayed out there and I was out there all king season, never saw a bear. And we're cooking breakfast in the morning when the clock goes, oh, hey, bear, I come marching around. Of course, the shotgun is in the tent between me and the bear. And well, I'm like, uh, mm -hmm. like I, I, I remember the words out of my mouth. I, I told I, I was out here for a month and a half, you know. I did not see a single bear. There's no bears out here. Mm -hmm. I turned the corner and this three-year-old, like one of those young bears just like stops and looks at me. He's like, yeah, you weren't there before. <laughs> of course the gun is in be, you know on the other side of the bear me like ah oh, crap and finally he went around and and we we got him out of there but yeah not not nothing too you know other than the last year the one that was about you know 20 25 feet made me pucker a little bit but i know guy I, I everybody that i've known that said they've been charged by a bear they've never been able to get their gun out of their holster and they've all been false charges i just don't want that one time to be me <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, I was say I carry I carry bear spray in my hip and I carry my 44 mag on my chest and I think that honestly that 44 mag I think is just there to make me feel better because I know mine way better off of that bear spray but still carry that 44 mag. Uh, when I had that bear at like 20 feet, I've never gotten anything off my my hip so quicker than bear spray. <laughs> yeah. I was like that, you know, like oh, you know. I also had a client throw a rock at a bull moose one time and the, my whole time, my hand's sitting on my, on my, on my, I only had my nine millimeter then. I had my hand on my nine millimeter and he throws it at this moose. I'm like, you idiot. Crazy. Californians. Crazy. Man. I love stories like this, man. I just, sorry to get off track. I just was wondering. Wow, dude. No, dude, you're That's good. What this it's all great, about. This has been a great podcast. A lot of good stories. You've had a lot of guiding experience and, Alaska, there's just something about Alaska that breeds great guide stories, man. Tell you what. Uh, and and it, the one thing that makes them all great is because 
I mean, I don't think you've been in the region that I've been in most most of the time. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, they're they're just different things. You know, different things happen in different areas. Yeah, different. You know, like I don't have all the timber. You know, structure on the Gula Walk. You know, like mm-hmm. I mean, we got some trees around, but it's not like I don't have twelve cottonwoods laying around. You know, there might be one overhanging tree that got push down but a lot of it's low hanging brush you know alders and stuff like that but hearing hearing your your like situations like oh man dude i'd be like i know this is the best place i'd be like i'd be setting up cones be like okay you don't go here you don't go through here this is the no zone <laughs> yeah i mean like i I've, I've picked up people who flip their kayaks on the road system where i've been guiding i mean i've been i've hit log jams and like that like it, it can be kind of sketchy. You could get pinned up real quick if you don't know what you're doing. Um, but I mean, I, I went and fished the Kenai. I've been up here for a year. I haven't fished the Kenai. I went down last weekend and just going down to fish the Kenai versus up on the parks. That's a totally different river. It's like a higher gradient. It's like shallow, like shallow riffle to a bucket, shallow riffle to a bucket. It's a lot like um the upper yakima i would say or like the bitter i fished the bitter in montana um and it's rocky bottom but you go up on the parks there's like no rocks it's sand it's low trees there's no mountains the tallest thing you see on like say willow are the trees are the willow trees you don't see giant peaks you don't see any of that it's just so different and then i've also i've got it out west a, a little bit i spent a week um up there in that bethel area um flew in and floated out and that's a totally different world out there too and and the different animals just everything's totally different it's amazing how you can be in one state and have so many different types of opportunities i think i think that's also one reason why i keep going back to the to the region that i do Mm -hmm. it's not because i'm familiar with it and i'm not afraid to learning but from flying around everywhere when i was with with mission lodge and, and, and going out to the Nushigak and going like 60 miles different from where I'm at in the tick tick wood system. Mm-hmm. Um, like it reminds me of a lot of, of where I grew up because of the trees. I mean, it's not like the big, you know, evergreens or anything like that, but you have a mountain range, you're in the mountain range area mm-hmm. there of the park system there where everything else that I've seen when I've gotten away from that has been that flat tundra, you know, Mm-hmm. The willows and it, it i mean it, it's cool in its own right you know those but this it's something about like it makes it feel like home to me in the in the park range where you actually have a mountain range and you can look at it and you're not this like well i can see that cloud for i don't know how far that is there's no landmark there's only one bluff you know so but it's 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 cool it's like hearing other people experience and, and like i know we're talking about different ways to fish and the different things working and stuff like that it's it's been it's it'd be cool to go go to some other places like i, I would wouldn't it'd be fun to get a group of guys together and go float the connect talk for a week you know or mm-hmm. or go float the togiak for a week or something like that it's i mean i i gotta do a month out there and i gotta fish kings out there for a little bit but i tell you what if i could go and float the togiak for probably mid probably late july to early august where you can get the spawning kings if they're if they're still up there and fish beads for big rainbows and stuff like that and then then go hit the hit the start of the silver run up there as you get down closer towards the bottom and uh it would it would that would be fun i mean but like i think i said keaton when you walked off like my dream place right now is to go fish the connect talk just because my old man was guiding on there. So, and I've heard good stories about that. And, and I, I believe the Duncan still own, own a camp up there that where he worked for. And so it's maybe, maybe I'll stop there one day before uh Colin or quit. So. Yeah. Heck yeah. That's a cool area. That's where the area where I was guiding. I wasn't on the connect talk, one of those nearby rivers and, it's a pretty cool area. A lot of there are a lot of fish that you might out there. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, cool. I think uh, we're we're running on the the two hour mark, and we got a few more questions for you. 
Oh, okay, I didn't know there's more questions. My bad, guys. No, you're no, all good. It, it, it's, it's, our, it's our rapid fire round, so they're quick questions. But no, it's been a great episode, a great podcast with you, Stephen. It's it's a, it's good to. Um, I think your your podcast has been good for not only one sharing stories, and they're they're really fun to share stories and hear stories, but just letting people know what it's like to be a guide and somebody who has been in the industry for a while and can and can speak on the fun parts of the job but also the not so fun parts of the job when you're trying to figure out what you're doing in the winter between seasons and the reality of what it's like to be in a relationship or not be in a relationship and the type of people that you deal with. Like you're not the first person that we've talked to um, that was promised that you were going to guide, um, but ended up just working, um, just working in camp. Um there's been times where I've been told I was going to do something or something's going to provide it for me and it hasn't happened. So it's, it's the realities of being in the industry. Clients see the best parts of you, of you and of the trip. They see fun day on the water. Um, they see lots of fish caught they have a good time. They fly home, but they don't see everything that goes on behind the scenes. You have a lot of people like, I want to go to Alaska to fish or, or I want to go to Alaska to guide but they don't know what actually goes into being an Alaskan guide or a guide in general. Same thing on the Yakima. They don't know how I used to freak out when I floated the farmland section because I was scared I was going to flip a boat in the farmlands. Yeah. Um, they don't see everything that goes on behind the scenes. And I think what you have said today, Stephen, is super beneficial, especially to new people looking to get into the industry. So we really appreciate your insight on that. Yeah, absolutely. And- and like you said earlier too, just to add on to that, I think you really highlighted the, like the ups and downs and the challenges that everyday life can put in to guiding, right? Like, I don't think in the time period that, you know, I've been guiding, I don't think like uh, a recession has crossed my mind, right? But like things happen through the markets and, and weather happens and, and life happens. And it's just, there's a bunch of things that you highlighted that, uh, uh, not everyone's going to see unless you listen to some someone that has that experience. And, and you, you know, you talk about the recession. Like, I mean, it, it affected me, but not like it did, you know, like the owners and having, you know, like gas prices skyrocketed up, up then. And, and, and then, you know, like having to cancel, I, I, I don't, I don't know how many people you have that would be like clientele up there, but, I know, I mean, I know some of the, the backside of running the business. I'm not like been, you know, a hundred percent grind into it. Like I do the numbers or anything like that. But so like some of those guys, like when it comes to, you know, like, like to take your deposit, obviously, but some of that deposit is actually used to get the things running up for that season. So like if you have to cancel trips, like, like they did on, on the Nushigak a couple years ago because they did a closure. I think that was maybe like 2010, 2011, somewhere in there. But if you had to issue refunds and you already spent that into either camp improvements or gas or anything like that, you're like, you're taking a financial burden right there going out. How do, you know, how do I look for the next season? How do I look for, you know, for that? Well, I need a motor for that, but the motor, can be anywhere from if it's a kicker, you know, from four thousand to eight thousand to a main motor being up to you know forty five to sixty thousand. You know, if it's brand new, you know, it's like all that stuff affects you. And I and I being with the people who I know that ran those businesses and seeing that, I, I got to see some of that myself. And it's like, okay, I respect your business, and I'll try to do this to keep your stuff, you know in shape and try to, you know, minimize your costs. I mean, I've, I'm from the financial side. I've never asked for a raise or anything like that. I'll, if you want to give me a raise, give me a raise. I'm up there to have fun, do it and love it. If I get a raise, better. you know what I mean? It's like, I hear people going, Oh, I didn't get enough money from that place. I didn't get enough money from that place. Be flat out honest with you, if I wanted to go make more money, I'd stay down here and do it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Those get, the people are running a business up there. They want to make a little bit of money too, but they're, they're, you know, you, you, you would make a, a lot, lot more money down here in the lower 48 than going out and being part of a, a bush guide, you know, and stuff like that. So 
Yeah. It, it's just the truth of it. I don't like I like I said at the beginning, I don't do it for the money. I do it because I love it. I do it for the for the entertainment purposes and putting smiles on people's face and and I use the term dream dream maker because some people's it is their lifetime, you know, dream, you know. I think Keaton, you and I were talking about this a little bit last night before uh, I fell asleep, you know, by texting you, you asked me the difference between a regular lodge and, and like a flyout lodge, right? Yeah. Well, flyout lodge, 90 or 80% of it, I feel like goes to aviation costs, which is not cheap. Like whether it's insurance, whether it's plane maintenance, whether it's aviation fill, right. You know, and like little lodges that, you know, either like, Oh, okay. Well, we'll add a, we'll add a flyout trip for 1500. If we can get a charter in here to, you know, take you out to, you know, to the Togiak from where we're at, for example, you know, then, and some of that stuff is, you know, it might not, it might cost the place a little bit of money because you have to pay for the pilot service. And usually most of those pilots, if you're, if you don't own the plane, they're charging you an hourly rate. And it's usually like, okay, well, um, I'm going to minimally charge you a three hour deal. So, you know, if I charge 1500 bucks an hour or something like that, you know, that's just numbers thrown out. And it's, uh, you know, your clientele is, is different in the, in the two places. And when I say like a dream maker, you might not have somebody go to a flyout lodge that can afford, you know, uh, a, a five figure trip, you know, and for somebody just going to do a four figure trip, you know, and somebody saving up for a four figure trip, they might be your blue collar worker trying to just my life. My, my dream is to go to Alaska. I don't care where it's at. I want to, I want to go home and take sockeye home. I want to go home and take Kings home, but I also want to do a mix of different things. That's their dream. That's what they put their money into. Why am I ever going to treat somebody that can afford a, you know, a five figure trip any differently than anybody's going to afford a, a, a four figure trip. It's, it's their money, their trip, you know, I'm going to try to put the same effort in for that person as I did, did the other person because it's, it's, it's what they're paying for and there's no difference to me. So yeah, for sure. Well, I think we've had a lot of great conversation here and I think that uh, we're going to kind of switch gears and we're going to roll into, uh, I think this is me and Kyle's like favorite portion. I mean, we love talking with people and, and hearing all this, but we like the like, these are kind of the ones that put you on the spot. So this is a rapid fire round um, and then we'll have one more thing and we'll get on rolling. So um, okay. are you ready? Well, uh- bring it <laughs> all right you want to take it off keaton yeah so here's our rapid fire round and uh to start out what is your favorite fish to fish for steelhead probably steelhead probably fi- i mean i'm you want you want fish for or you want that i caught that 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 that's two different things favorite thing that you fish for or like you're just your i would say your favorite fish in general you know, like steelhead. Cool. Still, they're, they're, they're unicorns nowadays. So yeah. it, it, it's definitely steelhead. A dream destination for you to go fishing. Um, Chile, Argentina, Patagonia, somewhere in there. Just, it's different. It's always been on a bucket list. I heard guides talk about it going down there in, in my beginning of campaigning. The guys would go. Alaska, get a little bit back home, and then they go spend three months in Chile. You know, I mean, it just that side of things fascinate me. Never been there, never done it. Yeah. Nice. What is okay? You're headed out on the water. You're going to fish. What is your favorite like snack and drink to have while you're out fishing? Um, I I drink a ton of water, so water is one. But if I had to pick something other than water, it's Probably, you know, don't drink and drive, but if you're out there floating or just, you know, spending several hours, but I I have to go with a Mac and Jack, uh, African Amber. That's my, that's my favorite beer. And I, I only drink it either where I'm sitting by a fire or sitting next to the lake. You know what I mean? I feel you. you. Um, snack wise, I don't know. Um, I'm a Reese's peanut butter cup guy. I like beef jerky. I I'm, I'm a guy. I like food. You know, yeah, good source of protein, something that kind of gets you rolling on the river, you know. Uh huh. 
Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm that guy that overpacks snacks, and I'm like, if, if I'm paying for a trip, like uh, the guy's like, you got, I was like, you want, you want a cupcake, you want beef jerky, man, you, you know, you want a granola bar, I don't, I don't care, take it, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm making sure I'm not hungry. <laughs> Heck yeah! All right, you're driving to the water, or you're getting ready. Maybe you're at camp. You're getting your gear ready for the day, and you want you gotta get pumped up to get there on the water. What are you listening to? Oh, geez, I listen to every type of music, but probably I, I told I told my buddy uh, one of the other things I'm I, I like I'm into MMA, like fighting, UFC, Bellator, all that stuff. I said the one song that would ever, I would ever walk out to and, and, and get me going. And it, it, it probably sounds weird or anything like that, but I've, I've kind of been a, a country guy for a long, long time, but it'd be Brantley Gilbert Dirt Road Anthem. There's something about that road or that song that just puts me in a mood where I'm chill, I'm ready, I'm just good to go. It, 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 there's really nothing pumped up about the song, but it's just the way the mood of that song is. Nice. I love it. I love it. I like it. All right. You're headed out the door to go fishing. Okay. And you're, you know, you're, you're grabbing your gear, you're collecting. What's that first thing that you go for when you're grabbing your gear? First thing that I go for, um, probably this hat. Um, if, if it's not, if I'm not fishing in this hat, my Sims camo, um, with the, with the, it's like American flag, but it's got the sim logo where all the stars are. If it's not that hat, it's either my Atlanta Braves uh, fishing hat or my Tri City Dust Devils fishing hat. I got those three, and it's like the first thing that I got to make sure it's on me. You know. Nice, nice. Um, Stephen, what is one thing that you do to help benefit the fisheries that you guide on, um, or and then? tying into that like maybe one thing that you do for conservation um of both again your fisheries the sport um and kind of keeping it alive for the next generation um uh, well where i've been at where i've worked one of the biggest things is education um i know you've probably heard of it up there and i know if unless you've been up in the in, in the bristol bay region um one of the biggest fights over the past 15 years or so, 16 years or so has been that pebble mine in the mm-hmm. whole region. And so making people aware of that is it, it, it making them educating them. Just let them know if they ask, if they have questions, if you don't have the answers, you turn around and you find the answer. So you, they can understand what's going on. Um, for that region, it's been education um, down here. Uh, little slippery slope depending on what side of the fence fence you roll with down here um i have some uh of beliefs of, of of when it comes to steelhead fishing that i've seen seen work i'm i'm a big broodstock fan and i've watched watched it work down here in oregon on the coast with people and i've watched it work originally on the uh on the soul duck with the Snyder creek uh broodstock program and i think it's I, I, you, you guys can cut this out, but this is a little bit of a tangent. Um, I grew up in Seattle, area fishing the Snoqualmie, and never, never saw a wild summer on hatchery fish when growing up there. And when they cut all that, and I haven't, I haven't fished it since. I'm, I'm sure there's, there's some, but not having, not having fish to fish for on that, on that east side is really hurt what people want to protect, you know? And, and, and I'm, I'm a hundred percent of protecting wild fish. I'm a hundred percent with that, that I want them there. My, I, I still haven't caught a 20 pound steel. Yet. I've hooked them. I still haven't landed one still, still one of my dreams, but I, I truly believe if you did some type of broodstock program or, or, or certain hatchery programs in, in this way, over here in the state of Washington, I, I believe you'd watch the numbers drive back oh, it, over the long run, you know, and it would help out with what everybody's fighting for too. Um, with not going into a whole political side of things and, and, and stuff like that. That's just my personal opinion, nothing else to tied to it and what I've seen and, and understand of, of 
what's going on and what are people people are fighting for you know so yeah um for sure it, it hurts it hurts because you know I, I i only got to go steal a fishing with my best friend a handful of times and we, we were fortunate to get him into one um on the callets but i would have loved to have gone over there and fish the snow quality more with him before he passed and, and all that stuff but not having that not seeing it not being a part of it anymore where i'm at now I'm trying to travel four hours to try to go find a steelhead fishing and, and then fish one day it makes it hard not to go fishing and then you know you know when i'm up here in hermes and it take you know takes those fish those summer runs three months to get up here and just i i want to protect them at the same time but i also want to want to fish for them because like you guys asked me like what's the one fish i, I love steelhead fishing man so no oh, that's good man we appreciate that yeah <clears throat> well keaton we want to wrap wrap it up with our last question yeah we uh we love to kind of finish our uh, podcast with your favorite kind of fishing moment or guide moment uh it could be a moment you learned something it could be a moment you had a great time with someone um just anything that you think would be a, a good story that you just want to share and send this podcast out the door uh i'll, I'll break it down in a in a <clears throat> in a couple different um I said earlier, any, any father and son moment, um, is, is special to me. Nothing against anybody else who's ever been in my boat or anything like that. It just, to repay it forward for what my dad, you know, did for me, for what, what Bob did for me, for, you know, all that stuff, those moments, baiting my hook, um, casting for me, teaching me this, telling me to catch here, take me fishing when he didn't even have fishing when I did and giving my first deal it on my own. That, that Those moments are great. Um, personally, I, I was very fortunate to go down to Florida and fish with one of my buddies and, and, and one of one of my longtime clients to make it happen. Uh, kind of a little revenge on my, on my dad for going bone fishing without me. Um, so I went and fished tarpon without him. Um, I ended up, um, my buddy, my buddy said it would take about three days to guarantee to get me a tarpon, whether it was gear or whether it was that. So we booked three days and on the end of the first day swinging in between some islands, I caught my first tarpon on a fly that was about 120 pounds. Um, and, and I, I found out afterwards and, and, and miss Leslie, the client that, I, that I'm was with that she loves to fish she's fished everywhere um she's one of the first airline pilots he he told her she didn't tell me this but like your first tarpon on a fly is like probably like within the five to seven percent of people most of them do it on gear first you know i mean and, and when i got down there i didn't realize how how tough it was going to be because you know i mean like we we threw like we one time we threw crab like soft shell crab and I think it was soft shell. We threw it into a, into a school of them. And it took us 30 minutes to get a bite. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, you just don't force them to bite, not like a trout or anything like that where you shove it in their face. It's when they want to grab it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and Leslie outfished me there. Um, probably guiding moment, other than the father and son, the one that sticks out to me, I had a I had a guy who I got it before that that you know host trips for for company out of Oklahoma and, and, and Texas and people love dry fly fishing, man. And and watching things come up for dry and, and you know you guys know rowing a boat trying to get it to a deal. You know, oh is that a good spot? The guys like, oh, I was like, no, can you get it a little bit further? You know, there's just a little edge right there. Everything he did to put this this missing link caddis, and I still know I know the spot every day and watch it. And I didn't get to see the rise, you know, and, you know, I think the biggest trout I've ever put into anybody up there is probably, probably about 24 inches, 23 and a half, 24, which is still a decent trout. Especially down here, anything, you know, over 18, we say is a, is a, is a phenomenal trout down here. Um, personally, my biggest is 27. The personally, the biggest, what, uh, um, that I've seen caught is 30 when I was a camp hand. that fish up from the Quijet. Remind me of a steelhead to a T. Um, but this guy um, set the hook. I was like, oh, I like, you know, you know, it's like, oh, dude, we'll just release it. And I got a glimpse of the fish in the water. And I was like, oh, 
okay, row over, you know, we get out, we take pictures. And it was, it was only 20 inches, but the fish was kind of a little football. And it was probably one of the most beautiful fish I've ever, ever seen on the Gula Walk. And awesome. for, for this last year, it's probably one of my, one of my favorite moments. Just, just his story of oh, just getting it out there a little bit further and, and, and getting there. I mean, I can, I can go with Kings. I can go stories. I mean, if you guys just want to go do a, another session of just stories from Alaska and, and jokes and, and just other stories, I can do that at some point in time too. Um, but that one's there. I mean, I probably have, I could go back and go, Oh yeah, this fish. And, and it's amazing. Like I, I couldn't tell you, you know, an average fish, but you know, certain moments, you know, you can tell you to the D to, to the D to the T of where you were at, what you're using, you know, yeah, it, it, it's crazy. That's, that's one that sticks out, you know, um, I got, I got to fish the moraine with my dad, you know, with bears and stuff all around us like that. He caught some nice ones and, doing bead fishing i mean there there's so many where i can go off and go on that that, that are are memorable you know what i mean but like for me personally it was the tarpon um my, i think i mentioned my my best friend steelhead um that that trout you know i think i mentioned a story earlier to you guys about the kid never catching a pike and spending three hours trying to catch a pike out of this little back slough you know yeah. making his dream come through. Um, there, there, there's certain moments, there's certain guys that you, you guided every year, that, you know, that when I was guiding Kings, there's a guy from Seattle. He's a big UW fan. I'm a, I'm a cougar. He'd get, he'd come off the plane and goes, Oh, look, there's my favorite cougar. And I'd be like, Mike, you have any other cougar fans? Nope. You're the only one, you know, <laughs> those connections that you make with people that you've seen, you know, whether it's a four day, four day week period that you see them once a year or, or the connections are endless and priceless, you know? Yeah. So you never know one of the, like, if you guys get, if anybody ever gets into this, one of these guys might become your boss someday, you know, one of these guys might see your work ethic. One of these guys might be, Hey, you know, I, I run not like, not the guy that I work heating air with, with, with before, but you could be like, some guy can be like, Hey, you ever been interested in heating and air, you know, like, Hey, you ever get done with this? We'll see if we can transition to that. Or, you know, some guy, Oh, I'm in sales. You know, if you want to sell gas fittings or something like that, you know, like yeah. a, this, the, the memories are priceless. Like I, I can't really sp speak for other people, but I know, I know Bob had some guys that he guided at mission lodge that ended up becoming his clients, you know, down here in Washington and he guided them. These guys would come up with a certain group, you know, certain year, you know, certain time every year, same group of people. They'd make shirts every year. So, I mean, they're just connections that are endless that you get to do in this. So to pinpoint any particular one that I, that I named, it, it, it's tough. You know what I mean? Wow. Like there's so I, many. I, I told, I told you about Leslie who I went tarpon fishing with. She came up the very first week. She comes in early because she's been a client for there forever and she just likes to sit on the porch and drink wine and, and smoke smoke a cigarette and enjoy the scenery be a break from from the dallas fort worth area i think that's where she's at i took her up she caught the biggest rainbow trout of her life that she'd been going up there for five years uh, she caught it like a 20 21 incher you know on a dry fly you know the, the, those memories that you know she caught i think i I don't remember if, if, if I was, but I, I'm pretty sure I was one of the first silvers on a fly with her when she came back up. You know, it's like that's awesome, man. a dream maker, man. I, that's the best way I can put it. You're a dream maker when you get to do this, man. Yeah. Whether it's somebody's first time ever, <clears throat> ever fly fishing or if they've been doing it since they were 13 years old, you know, after watching the river run through or, you know. You get it's, to, in in some ways, you get to set up. There's, you know, one day we could have one of your clients on, and they could remember those moments, right? And you you could talk about that. So, uh, yeah, I, I I will add one thing here. Like some of the most humbling experiences, and 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 you guys might might say this too, but when you get somebody in in the boat, and you watch them cast, and you go, 
oh shit, that guy can cast better than me. Yeah. And they turn around and go, hey, if you see anything wrong, let me know. No, no, no. Just, 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 just continue casting. You know, <laughs> yeah. this is a dream work right here for me, man. I don't have to instruct. You know, let me just tell you how to do something a little bit different with my setup. But, though, I mean, he's doing great. There's, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a piece of story to everything. You know, yeah. and there's new chapters each year. And you know, I, I think, I think I like when I first got on Instagram, I, I shared a bunch of. Of, of, of photos and a story and there's one country song that, that just popped out to me it was by um um guy who used to pitch i want to say for old miss um brett eldridge i think that's wrong but but it's called chapters and he does it with devin degraw and i used that one and it went from like me being a camp hand you know guiding kings and then like up to now with like you know like six or seven pictures in a story and i was like that's perfect you know that that song is perfect for right yeah somebody who's done it this long you know like and you want to share little bits of this and little bits of that with people and it uh it's priceless they're chapters yeah. there's memories you guys do it you guys you know well yeah, for sure. And you know, I, uh, I, I, yeah, you said it well. You said it well. So I think that we're kind of getting towards the end here. We're going to have to get some more time on with you and share. We, maybe we need to do something where we just share some stories and just chat and hang out. Oh, um, I don't know what your guys' schedules are. I don't know how well my internet's going to be up this summer, but maybe yeah. we can connect. Um, we're, we're we're supposed to be getting the Starlink from Mr. Elon Musk up there, which is supposed to help some of these remote camps. But um, we'll see. I had I had real trouble with internet issues last year, so I try not to do any of the streaming or, or any anything. But if it gets better, maybe I can. We could you do a little update on your guide season and stuff. That'd oh yeah, awesome. you know, like you know, like maybe maybe I can uh give you a tour of the lodge or something like you guys and you guys can share it with people or, or maybe we can just do a, a mid mid season update or, or, you know, transitioning yeah. of what's going on. And Absolutely. Give, give, give some folks that are interested in Alaska, you know, yeah, I, 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 I don't, you know, I don't do much other than try to hunt and fish and show up for, for whatever, you know, seasonal job I'm doing. So, Anytime you guys ever want to BS or chat or, you know, like Keaton, if you want to, you know, if I can get the time and you get the time, if you want to like hook up and bank fish or do a small float on the Akama or something like that, or if you got a pontoon and just want to leapfrog each other. And I, I did that last year in the fall with some guy from California. He's like, Hey, you want a shuttle? I'm like, that beats the heck out of, you know, paying the shuttle to get my rig down there just with pontoon, you know? Yeah. And, and we had a good time and we, Send, send him a you know Christmas text and stuff like that and you know hell yeah dude I hope you're doing well catch some yeah. fish you know, good luck in Alaska and, you know yeah it's the connection oh, you make so one thing that I, I I would like to add that just popped in my head about like you know people like using Alaska and wanting to work up there um the Alaska's big we all know Alaska's big but the guiding community is also small. Once you start going to places and, and and meeting people that have been here and been there, word gets out on people really, really quick. So um you know, like we just we hired a guy that worked with two other guys that's worked with us. And so we already know we've heard stories about him, we already know who he is and and, and you know how he's gonna fit in and, and stuff like that. And that was, you know, five years ago when when I heard the first story about him. Now I'm working with him. So it's it's a big world, but the community, and, and and it's 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 a big, it's also a big who you know as well, man. So if you if you ever want to like get pointed in the right direction, anybody can reach out to me as well. So and I'll respond as quickly as I can, you know. Especially with me being gone, it might not be until an evening or something like that. So yeah, so appreciate yeah. that. Well, cool. I think we're gonna send this one out the door. And, uh, I, you know, I just want to, uh, let 
you know that we appreciate you hopping on and just sharing all these stories like a lot of great information here and for people trying to become a guide and stuff like that so uh, my pleasure man like people did it for me the least i can do is reach about reach back out for for other people you know and it, and some people are afraid to ask so um just hearing stories and and i don't know maybe there's some some young 10 11 12 year old out there that doesn't know what he's getting into but the stories sound fun. And I mean, I know Kyle and I going up to Alaska, or maybe Kyle moves back down here. There's going to be a position at some point in time. I don't think anywhere in the near future, Alaska is going to die for fishing. So they're always going to need guides. And yeah, absolutely. You know, Not like down you know, here. Yeah, it's, uh, we got our own it, problems. Oh yeah. You know, like if somebody wants to reach out and find out what they have to do or they need an in or, or want to ask about a, a certain fishery that I, I know if I don't know it or if I don't know much about it, I'll ask a couple buddies that do and, and point them in the right direction or, you know, for sure. Or, Sounds good. I, it's a pleasure guys. I, yeah. I appreciate it. Sorry if we talked, you know, no, you're long good. Else. You're good. I'll I, get you back on. It's, it was, easy, it's, easy, it's easy to talk about something that oh, you love, you know, 100%. It's, you know, it's cool. like, I'm going to do the outro on this and then we're going to call it good and we'll have to connect soon, hopefully before you go. So. All right, guys. All right, cool. Well, we want to thank Steven for hopping on the podcast today and just sharing some stories and talking about the guide life with us. Um, we also want to thank all the listeners that take the time to listen to our podcast um, and leave us ratings on Apple podcasts and Spotify uh, and Google Podcasts, so we appreciate you there. Uh, also, make sure to go check out our website, uh, www.theyoungguidespodcast.com, and you can listen to our podcast, learn about um, people like Stephen and other you know past guests that we've had on. And then me and Kyle have been working at doing some learning center stuff <clears throat> and trying to give information and tips on you know some rod selections and where to go and what to do and. So we're, we're working on that slowly. It's popping up here and there when we can. So um, I just want to thank you guys again for taking the time. And uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Young Guides podcast. And Keaton is leaving. And so is Kyle. And so is Steven. So we'll catch you on the next one. Peace. <laughs>